$1.1 trillion spending bill. The director of the FBI, James Comey, answered questions about the decision to announce an investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails had been reopened just days before the 2016 presidential election. He testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee in a hearing that also covered data encryption challenges for law enforcement and the investigation of Russian hacking. Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa chairs this four-hour hearing. It's 10.30 or 10.45, but there is a vote scheduled on the Senate floor. It's my intention to keep the meeting going during that vote, uh, and we'll take turns going. So uh, somebody uh, needs to be here presiding uh, while I go vote, and I won't. Uh, I'll run over and run back, and, uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll do the questioning according to the fall of the gavel or, or uh, early birds, uh, whichever rule applies. Uh, Director Comey, uh, welcome. Uh, we thank the FBI for what it does to keep America safe. There's been a lot of controversy surrounding the FBI since the last time you were here in 2015. In March, you publicly acknowledged that the FBI is investigating allegations of coordination between the Trump uh, campaign and Russia's efforts to interfere in the 2016 election. Under President Obama's order, former DNI Clapper had been in charge of the intelligence community's review of that in inference. Mr. Clapper testified that President Obama asked the intelligence community to compile all available information. After he left office, Mr. Clapper said there was no evidence of collusion whatsoever. The New York Times reported that American officials found no proof of collusion. So where is all this speculation about collusion coming from? In January, BuzzFeed published a dossier spinning wild conspiracy theories about the Trump campaign. BuzzFeed acknowledged that the claims were unverified and some of the details were clearly wrong. BuzzFeed has since been sued for publishing them. Since then, much of the dossier has been proven wrong, and many of his outlandish claims have failed to gain traction. For example, no one's looking for moles or Russian agents embedded in the DNC. Yet some continue to quote parts of this document as if it were gospel truth. And according to press reports, the FBI has relied on the document to justify its current investigation. There have been reports that the FBI agreed to pay the author of the dossier, who paid his sources, who also paid their subsources. Where did the money come from? And what motivated the people writing the checks? The company that oversaw the dossier's creation, uh, Fusion GSP, 
uh, won't uh, speak to that point either. Its founder, Glenn Simpson, is refusing to cooperate with this company's, uh, committee's invest, investigation and inquiry. His company is also the subject of a complaint to the Justice Department. That complaint alleges that Fusion worked as an unregistered foreign agent for Russian interests and with a former Russian intelligence agency at the time it worked on the dossier. It was filed with the Justice Department in July, long before the dossier came out. The man who wrote the dossier admitted in court that it has unverified claims. Does that sound like a reliable basis for law enforcement or intelligence actions? Unfortunately, the FBI has provided me materially inconsistent information about these issues. That is why we need to know more about it, how much the FBI relied on it. Once you buy into the claim of collusion, then suddenly every interaction with a Russian can be twisted to seem like confirmation of a conspiracy theory. Now, I obviously don't know what the FBI will find. For the good of the country, I hope that the FBI gets to the truth soon, whatever that truth or that answer may be. If there are wrongdoers, they should be punished, and the innocent should have their names cleared. And in the meantime, this committee is charged with the oversight of the FBI. And we can't wait until this is all over to ask the hard questions. Uh, otherwise, too many people will have no confidence in the FBI's conclusions. The public needs to know what role the dossier has played and where it came from. And we need to know whether there was anything improper going on between the Trump campaign and the Russians. Or are these mere allegations just a partisan smear campaign that manipulated our government into choosing, chasing a conspiracy theory. Now, before the election, and before we knew about this notorious dossier, you, Chairman Comey, publicly released his findings that Secretary Clinton uh, was extremely careless in the handling of highly classified information, and this recommendation has no one, uh, and, the, and his recommendation that no one be prosecuted. According to a recent New York Times article, uh, he did it partly because he knew the Russians had a hacked email from a Democrat operative that might be released before the election. That email reportedly provided assurances that Attorney General Lynch would protect Secretary Clinton and make sure the FBI, quote unquote, didn't go too far. Despite Attorney General Lynch's prior connections to the Clintons and her now famous private conversation with former President Clinton during the investigation, she failed to recuse herself from that. The director's announcement effectively gave her cover uh, to have it both ways. She would appear publicly uninvolved but remain in control of the ultimate outcome. Moreover, in its haste to end a tough, politically charged investigation, the FBI failed to follow up on credible evidence of the intent to hide, hide federal records from the Congress and the public. It is a federal crime, as we know, to willfully and unlawfully conceal, remove, or destroy a federal record. Director Comey said that, quote, the FBI also discovered several thousands work-related emails, end of quote, that Secretary Clinton did not turn over to the State Department. He said the Secretary Clinton's lawyers, quote, cleaned their devices in such a way as to preclude complete forensic recovery, end of quote, of additional emails. The Justice Department also entered into immunity agreements limiting the scope of the FBI investigation. Some of these agreements prohibited the FBI from reviewing any emails on the laptops of the Clinton aides that were created outside of Secretary Clinton's tenure at state. But of course, any emails related to alienating records would not have been created until after she left office 
during the congressional and FBI reviews. And even though these records were subject to congressional subpoena and preservation records, the Justice Department agreed to destroy the laptops. So a cloud of doubt hangs over the FBI objectivity. The director says that the people at the FBI don't give a rip about politics. But uh, the director installed uh, as deputy director a man whose wife ran for elected office and accepted almost a million dollars from Governor Terry McAuliffe, a longtime friend and fundraiser of the Clintons and the Democratic Party. Andrew McCabe also reportedly met a person with Governor McAuliffe's office about his wife's political plans. And he did not recuse himself from the Clinton investigations or the Russian matter, despite the obvious appearance of conflict. The Inspector General is reviewing these issues, but once again, the people deserve answers, and the FBI has not provided those answers. We need the FBI to be accountable because we need the FBI to be effective. Its mission is to protect us from the most dangerous threats facing our nation. And as the director was last here, since the director was last here, the drumbeat of attacks on the United States from those directed or inspired by ISIS and other radical Islamic terrorists has continued. For example, in June 2016, a terrorist killed 49 and wounded another 53 in Orlando, frequently frequented by a gay and lesbian community. It was the most deadly attack in the United States soil since 9-11. But long afterwards, in September, a terrorist stabbed 10 at a mall in Minneapolis, and another terrorist injured 31 after he detonated bombs in New Jersey and New York City. And in November, a terrorist injured 13 after driving into students and teachers at Ohio State University. Our allies haven't been immune either, as we read in the newspaper frequently. We all recall the tragedy of July 2016 when terrorists plowed a truck through a crowd in France, killing over 80 people. So, we in the Congress need to make sure that the FBI has the tools it needs to prevent and investigate terrorism as well as other serious vi violent crimes. And these tools must, be, must adapt to both evolving technology and threats while preserving our civil liberties. I hope we can also hear from the director about the FBI's use of some of these tools that may require Congress's attention. And most obviously, the FISA Section 702 authority is up for reauthorization at the end of the year. This authority provides the government the ability to collect the electronic communications of foreigners outside the United States with the compelled assistance of American companies. And Bush and Obama administrations were strongly supportive of 702, and now the Trump administration is as well. From all accounts, the law has proven to be highly effective in helping to protect the United States and our allies. The Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board and many other federal courts have found Section 702 constitutional and consistent with our Fourth Amendment. Yet questions and concerns persist for many about its effects on our civil liberties, specifically in the way the FBI queries data collected under Section 702. In, order, in addition, the director has spoken out often about how the use of encryption by terrorists and criminals is eroding the effectiveness of one of the FBI's core investigative tools, a warrant based on probable cause. I look forward to an update from you, Director Comey, on the going dark problem. Uh, I'm also waiting for answers from the FBI's uh, advanced knowledge of an attempted terrorist attack 2015 Garland, Texas. Fortunately, the attack was interrupted by a local police officer, but not before a guard was shot. After the attack, the director claimed that the FBI did not have advanced knowledge of it but it was recently revealed that an undercover FBI agent was in close communication with one of the attackers in the weeks leading up to the attack. The undercover agent was in a car directly behind the attackers when they started shooting and fled the scene. The committee needs clarity on what the FBI knew, whether there was plans to disrupt any attack, 
and whether it shared enough information with local law enforcement. Uh, and obviously you expect me to always remind you about whistleblowers. Finally, as you know, the FBI Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act became law December 2016. It clarified that FBI employees are protected when they disclose wrongdoing to their supervisors. In April, we learned that the FBI still has not updated its policies and done much to educate employees on the new law. The Inspector General gave the FBI updated training uh, this uh, past January. Employees who know that they're protected are more likely to come forward with evidence of waste, fraud, and abuse. They should not have to wait many months to be trained on such a significant change in their rights and their protections. And these are all important issues, and I look forward to discussing them with you, Director Comley. The public's faith of the FBI, Congress, and our democratic process has been tested lately. Oversight and transparency hopefully will restore that faith. Uh, you may take as long as you want, Senator. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, as you stated, uh, this is the committee's annual oversight hearing uh, to conduct that oversight of the FBI. So usually we review and ask questions about the FBI's work that ranges from major federal law enforcement priorities to the specific concerns of individual members of the committee. However, this hearing takes place at a unique time. Last year, for the first time, the FBI and its investigation of a candidate for president became the center of the closing days of a presidential election. Before voters went to the polls last November, they had been inundated with stories about the FBI's investigation of Senator Clinton's emails. The press coverage was wall to wall. Every day there was another story about Secretary Clinton's emails. Every day questions were released, uh, yeah, class, uh, every day questions were raised about whether classified information had been released or compromised. And over and over again, there was commentary from the FBI about its actions and investigation. On July 5th, 2016, two months before the election, Director Comey publicly announced that the FBI had concluded its investigation and determined that no reasonable prosecutor would bring a case against Secretary Clinton. That should have been the end of the story, but it wasn't. Eleven days before the election, on October 28, 2016, Director Comey then announced that the FBI was reopening the Clinton investigation because of emails on Anthony Weiner's computer. This explosive announcement, and it was, came unprompted and without knowing whether a single email warranted a new investigation. It was, in fact, a big October surprise. But in fact, as it turned out, not one email on the laptop changed the FBI's original conclusion that no prosecution was warranted. And only two days before the election, the FBI sent another public letter to Congress affirming its original conclusion. This was extraordinary, plain and simple. I join those who believe that the actions taken by the FBI did, in fact, have an impact on the election. What's worse is that while all of this was going on in the public spotlight, while the FBI was discussing its investigation into Senator Clinton's email server in detail, I cannot help but note that it was noticeably silent about the investigation into the Trump campaign and Russian interference into the election. In June 2016, the press reported that Russian hackers had infiltrated the computer system of the Democratic National Committee. In response, then-candidate Trump and his campaign began goading the Russian government into hacking Secretary Clinton. Two months later, in August, on Twitter, 
Roger Stone declared, trust me, it will soon be Podesta's time in the barrel, end quote. He then bragged that he was in communication with WikiLeaks, and this was during a campaign, the campaign in Florida. He told a group of Florida Republicans that founder Julian Assange said uh, that founder Julian Assange and that there would be no telling what the October surprise might be, end quote. Clearly, he knew what he was talking about. Two months later, on October 7, thousands of emails from John Podesta's account were published on Wiki WikiLeaks. We now know that through the fall election, the FBI was actively investigating Russia's efforts to interfere with the presidential campaign and possible involvement of Trump campaign officials in those efforts. Yet the FBI remained silent. In fact, the FBI summarily refused to even acknowledge the existence of any investigation. It's still very unclear and I hope, Director, that you will clear this up. Why the FBI's treatment of these two investigations was so dramatically different. With the Clinton email investigation, it has been said that, quote, exceptional circumstances, end quote, including the high interest in the matter and the need to reassure the public, required public comment from the FBI. However, I can't imagine how an unprecedented, big and bold hacking interference in our election by the Russian government did not also present exceptional circumstances. As I said at the beginning, we're in a unique time. A foreign adversary had actively interfered with a presidential election. The FBI was investigating not just that interference, but whether campaign officials associated with the president were connected to this interference. And the attorney general has recused himself from any involvement in this investigation. At the same time, the FBI must continue to work with its state and local law enforcement partners and the intelligence community as well to investigate crime of all types violent crime, increased narcotic trafficking, fraud, human trafficking, terrorism, child exploitation, public corruption, and yesterday this committee had a very important hearing on hate and crimes against specific religions and races, which are off the charts. In order to do all of that, I firmly believe it is of the utmost importance that the American people have faith and trust in the nation's top law enforcement agency. We must be assured that all of the FBI's decisions are made in the interest of justice, not in the interest of any political agenda or reputation of any one agency or individual. So, Mr. Director, today we need to hear how the FBI will regain that faith and trust we need straightforward answers to our questions, and we want to hear how you're going to lead the FBI going forward. We never, ever want anything like this to happen again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Comey, I'd like to swear you in at this point. Um, you, affirm, you affirm that the testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help God. Thank you very much. Uh, as the old saying goes, for somebody as famous as you, you don't need any introduction, so I'm going to just introduce you as director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, but to once again thank you for being here today, and we look forward to your testimony and answer to our questions. You may begin. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Feinstein, members of the committee, thank you for having this annual oversight hearing about the FBI. I know, know that sounds a little bit like someone saying they're looking forward to going to the dentist, but I really do mean it. I think oversight of the FBI of all parts of government, but especially the one I'm lucky enough to lead, is essential. I think it was John Adams who wrote to Thomas Jefferson that power always thinks it has a great soul. 
the way you guard against that is having people ask hard questions. Ask good questions and demand straightforward answers, and I promise you I will do my absolute best to give you that kind of answer today. Uh, I also appreciate the conversation I know we're going to have today and over the next few months about reauthorizing Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that you mentioned, Mr. Chairman. This is a tool that is essential to the safety of this country. I did not say the same thing about the collection of telephone dialing information by the NSA. I think that's a useful tool. 702 is an essential tool, and if it goes away, we will be less safe as a country. And I mean that, and we'll be happy to talk more about that. Thank you for engaging on that so we can tell the American people why this matters so much and why we can't let it go away. As you know, the magic of the FBI that you oversee is its people. And we talk, as we should, a lot about our counterterrorism work, about our counterintelligence work, and I'm sure we'll talk about that today. But I thought I would just give you some idea of the work that's being done by those people all over the country, all over the world, every day, every night, all the time. And I pulled three cases that happened and were finished in the last month just to illustrate it. The first was something I know that you followed closely, the plague of threats against Jewish community centers that this country experienced in the first few months of this year. Children frightened, old people frightened, terrifying threats of bombs at Jewish institutions, especially the Jewish community centers. The entire FBI surged in response to that threat, working across all programs, all divisions, our technical wizards, using our vital international presence, and using our partnerships, especially with the Israeli National Police, we made that case, and the Israelis locked up the person behind those threats and stopped that terrifying plague against the Jewish community centers. Second case I wanted to mention is, all of you know what a botnet is. These are the zombie armies of computers that have been taken over by criminals, lashed together in order to do tremendous harm to innocent people. Last month, the FBI, working with our partners with the Spanish National Police, took down a botnet called the Kelios botnet and locked up the Russian hacker behind that botnet who made a mistake that Russian criminals sometimes make of leaving Russia and visiting the beautiful city of Barcelona. And he's now in jail in Spain. And the good people's computers who had been lashed to that zombie army have now been freed from it and are no longer part of a huge criminal enterprise. And the last one I'll mention is this past week, for the first time since Congress passed a statute making it a crime in the United States to engage in female genital mutilation, to mutilate little girls. It's been a felony in the United States since 1996. We made the first case last week against doctors in Michigan for doing this terrifying thing to young girls all across the country with our partners in the Department of Homeland Security. We brought a case against two doctors for doing this to children. This is among the most important work we do, protecting kids especially, and it was done by great work that you don't hear about a whole lot all across the country by the FBI. It is the honor of my life. I know you look at me like I'm crazy for saying this about this job. I love this work. I love this job. And I love it because of the mission and the people I get to work with. Some of whose work I just illustrated by pulling those three cases from last month. But it goes on all the time, all around the country, and we're safer for it. I love representing these people, speaking on their behalf, and I look forward to your questions today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for your opening statement. I'm going to start out probably with a couple subjects you wish I didn't bring up, and then a third one that I think uh, everybody needs to hear your opinion on a policy issue. Uh, it is frustrating when the FBI refuses to answer this committee's questions, but leaks relevant information to the media. In other words, they don't talk to us, but somebody talks to the media. Director Comey, have you ever been an anonymous source in news reports about matters relating to the Trump investigation or the Clinton investigation? Never. Uh, question two on relatively uh, related. Have you ever authorized someone else at the FBI to be an anonymous source in news reports about the Trump investigation or the Clinton investigation? No. Has any classified information relating to President Trump or his association, associates been declassified or, and shared with the media? Not to my knowledge.
You testified before the House Intelligence Committee that a lot of classified matters have ended up in the media recently. Without getting into any particular article, I want to emphasize that, without getting into any particular article, is there an investigation of any leaks of classified information relating to Mr. Trump or his associates? I don't want to, I don't want to answer that question, Senator, for reasons I think you know. Uh, there have been a variety of uh, leaks. Well, leaks are always a problem, but especially in the last three to six months. And where there is a leak of classified information, the FBI, if it's our information, makes a referral to the Department of Justice, or if it's another agency's information, they do the same, and then DOJ authorizes the opening of an investigation. I don't want to confirm in an open setting whether there are any investigations open. Uh, you, I want to challenge you on that because the government regularly acknowledges when it's investigating classified leaks. Uh, you did that in the Valerie Plain case. Uh, what's the difference here? Well, the most important difference is I don't have authorization from the department to confirm any of the investigations they've authorized. And it may be that we can get that at some point, but I'm not going to do it sitting here in an open setting without having talked to them. Then I can, uh, I, you can expect me to follow up on that offer. Sure. There are several senior FBI officials who would have had access to the classified information that was leaked, including yourself and the deputy director. So how can the Justice Department guarantee the integrity of the investigations without designating an agency other than the FBI to gather the facts and eliminate senior FBI officials as suspects? Well, I'm not going to answer about any particular investigations, but there are, I know of situations in the past where if you think the FBI or its leadership are suspects, you have another investigative agency support the investigation by federal prosecutors. It can be done and has been done in the past. Okay. Uh, moving on to another subject, the New York Times recently reported that the FBI had found a troubling email among the ones the Russians hacked from Democrat operatives. The email reportedly provided assurances that Attorney General Lynch would protect Secretary Clinton by making sure the FBI investigation, quote, unquote, didn't go too far. How and when did you first learn of this document? Also, who sent it and who received it? That's not a question I can answer in this forum, Mr. Chairman, because it would call for a classified response. I have briefed the leadership of the Intelligence Committees on that particular issue, but I can't talk about it here. Uh, you can expect me to follow up with you on that point. Sure. What steps did the FBI take to determine whether Attorney General Lynch had actually given assurances that the political fix was in no matter what? Did the FBI interview the person who wrote the email? If not, why not? I have to give you the same answer. I can't talk about that in an unclassified setting. Okay, then you can expect me to follow up on that. I asked the FBI to provide this email to the committee before today's hearing. Why haven't you done so? And will you provide it by the end of this week? Again, to, to react to that, I have to give a classified answer, and I can't give it sitting here. So that means you can't give me the email? Uh, I'm not confirming there was an email, sir. I can't. The subject is classified. And in an appropriate forum, I'd be happy to brief you on it. Okay. But I can't do it in an open hearing. Uh, I assume that uh, other members of the committee could have access to that briefing if they want it. Uh, I want to talk about going dark. Director Comey, a few years ago, you testified before the committee about going dark problem <clears throat> and the inability of law enforcement to access encrypted data despite the existence of a lawfully issued court order. You continue to raise this issue in your public speeches, speeches most recently at Boston College. My question, you mentioned it again in your testimony briefly, but can you provide the committee with a more detailed update on the status of going dark problem and how it has affected the FBI's ability to access encrypted data? Has there been any progress collaborating 
with the technology sector to overcome any problems? At our hearing in 2015, you said you didn't think legislation was necessary at that time. Is that still your view? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The shadow created by the problem we call going dark continues to fall across more and more of our work. Take devices, for example. The ubiquitous default full disk encryption on devices is affecting now about half of our work. First six months of this fiscal year, FBI examiners were presented with over 6,000 devices for which we had lawful authority, search warrant or court order to open. And in 46% of those cases, we could not open those devices with any technique. That means half of the devices that we encounter in terrorism cases, in counterintelligence cases, in gang cases, in child pornography cases, cannot be opened with any technique. That is a big problem. And so the shadow continues to fall. I'm determined to continue to make sure the American people and Congress know about it. I know this is important to the president and the new attorney general. I don't know yet how the new administration intends to approach it, but it's something we have to talk about. Because like you, I care a lot about privacy. I also care an awful lot about public safety. And there continues to be a huge collision between those two things we care about. So I look forward to continuing that conversation, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you didn't uh, respond to the part about do you still have the view that legislation is not needed? I don't know the answer yet. It, okay. As I, I think I said, I hope I said last time we talked about this, it may require a legislative solution at some point. The Obama administration was not in a position where they were seeking legislation. I don't know yet how President Trump intends to approach this. I know he spoke about it during the campaign. I know he cares about it, but it's premature for me to say. Okay. Senator Feinstein. Thank you. Uh, Director, I have one question regarding my opening comment, and I view it as a most important question, and I hope you will answer it. Why was it necessary to announce 11 days before a presidential election that you were opening an investigation on a new computer without any knowledge of what was in that computer? Why didn't you just do the investigation as you would normally, with no public announcement? Yeah, great question, Senator. Thank you. Um, October 27th, the investigative team that had finished the investigation in July, focused on Secretary Clinton's emails, asked to meet with me. So I met with them that morning, late morning, in my conference room, and they laid out for me what they could see from the metadata on this fella Anthony Weiner's laptop that had been seized in an unrelated case. What they could see from the metadata was that there were thousands of Secretary Clinton's emails on that device, including what they thought might be the missing emails from her first three months as Secretary of State. We never found any emails from her first three months. She was using a Verizon Blackberry then, and that's obviously very important. Because it, if there was evidence that she was acting with bad intent, that's where it would be in the but first three months. But they weren't there. Look, can I just finish my answer, Senator? Yeah. And so they came in and said, we can see thousands of emails from the Clinton email domain, including many, many, many from the Verizon Clinton domain, BlackBerry domain. They said, we think we got to get a search warrant to go get these. And the Department of Justice agreed we had to go get a search warrant. So I agreed. I authorized them to seek a search warrant. And then I faced a choice. And I've lived my entire career by the tradition that if you can possibly avoid it, you avoid any action in the run-up to an election that might have an impact, whether it's a dog catcher election or president of the United States. But I sat there that morning, and I could not see a door labeled no action here. I could see two doors, and they were both actions. One was labeled speak, the other was labeled conceal. Because here's how I thought about it. I'm not trying to talk you into this, but I want you to know my thinking. Having repeatedly told this Congress, we are done and there's nothing there. There's no case there, there's no case there. To restart in a hugely significant way, potentially finding the emails that would reflect on her intent from the beginning and not speak about it would require an act of concealment, in my view. And so I stared at speak and conceal. Speak would be really bad. There's an election in 11 days. Lordy, that would be really bad. Concealing, in my view, would be catastrophic, not just to the FBI, but well beyond. And honestly, as between really bad and catastrophic, I said to my team, we've got to walk into the world of really bad. I've got to tell Congress that we're restarting this, not in some frivolous way, in a hugely significant way. And the team also told me, we cannot finish this work before the election. 
And then they worked night after night after night, and they found thousands of new emails. They found classified information on Anthony Weiner. Somehow, her emails are being forwarded to Anthony Weiner, including classified information by her assistant, Huma Abedin. And so they found thousands of new emails and then called me the Saturday night before the election and said, thanks to the wizardry of our technology, we've only had to personally read 6,000. We think we can finish tomorrow morning, Sunday. And so I met with them. And they said, we found a lot of new stuff. We did not find anything that changes our view of her intent. So we're in the same place we were in July. It hasn't changed our view. And I asked them lots of questions. And I said, okay, if that's where you are, then I also have to tell Congress that we're done. Look, this was terrible. It makes me mildly nauseous to think that we might have had some impact on the election. But honestly, it wouldn't change the decision. Everybody who disagrees with me has to come back to October 28th with me and stare at this and tell me what you would do. Would you speak or would you conceal? And I could be wrong, but we honestly made a decision between those two choices that even in hindsight, and this has been one of the world's most painful experiences, I would make the same decision. I would not conceal that on October 28th from the Congress. And I sent a letter to Congress. By the way, people forget this. I didn't make a public announcement. I sent a private letter to the chairs and the rankings oh, of the wow. oversight committees. Did I know it's a that? distinction without a difference in the world of leaks, but it, is, it was very important that I tell them instead of concealing. And reasonable people can disagree, but that's the reason I made that choice. And it was a hard choice. I still believe in retrospect the right choice, as painful as this has been. And I'm sorry for the, the long answer. Well, let me respond. On the letter, it was just a matter of minutes before the world knew about it. Secondly, my understanding, and the staff has just said to me, that you didn't get a search warrant before making the announcement. I think that's right. I think I authorized, and the Department of Justice agreed we were going to seek a search warrant. I actually don't see it as a meaningful distinction. Well... It very, it, it's very hard. It would have been, you took an enormous gamble. The gamble was that there was something there that would invalidate uh, her candidacy. And there wasn't. So one has to look at that action and say, did it affect the campaign? And I think most people who have looked at this say, yes, it did affect the campaign. Why would he do it? And was there any conflict among your staff, people saying do it, people saying don't do it, as has been reported? No, there was a great debate. I have a fabulous staff at all levels. And one of my junior lawyers said, should you consider that what you're about to do may help elect Donald Trump president? And I said, Thank you for raising that, not for a moment, because down that path lies the death of the FBI as an independent institution in America. I can't consider for a second whose political fortunes will be affected in what way. We have to ask ourselves, what is the right thing to do, and then do that thing? I'm very proud of the way we debated it, and at the end of the day, everyone on my team agreed we have to tell Congress that we are restarting this in a hugely significant way. Well, there's a way to do that. I don't know whether it would work or not, but certainly in a classified way, carrying out your tradition of not announcing uh, investigations. And, yeah. you, you know, I look at this exactly the opposite way you do. Um, everybody knew it would influence the investigation before, that there was a very large uh, percentage of chance that it would. And yet that percentage of chance was taken, and there was no information, and the election was lost. So it seems to me that before uh, your department does something like this, you really ought to, because it, <laughs> Senator Leahy began to uh, talk about other, other investigations, and I think this theory does not hold up when you look at other investigations. But let me go on to um, 702, because uh, you began your comments saying how important it is. And yes, it is uh, important. Um, we've got, a, I think, a, a problem. And um, the issue that we're going to need to address is the FBI's practice of searching 702 data using U.S. person identifiers as query terms. 
and some have called this an unconstitutional backdoor search, while others say that such queries are essential to assuring that potential terrorists don't slip through the cracks as they did before. So could you give us your views on that and how it might be handled to avoid the charge, which may bring down 702? No, thank you, Senator. It's a really important issue. The way 702 works is, under that provision of the statute, the FISA court, federal judges, authorize us as U.S. agencies to collect the communications of non-U.S. people that we believe to be overseas if they're using American infrastructure. The criticism the FBI has gotten and the feedback we've gotten consistently since 9-11 is, you have to make sure you're in a position to connect the dots. You can't have stovepiped information. And so we've responded to that over the last 10 years, mostly to the great work of my predecessor, Bob Mueller, and we have confederated databases so that if we collect information under 702, it doesn't sit in a separate stovepipe. It sits in a single cloud-type environment so that if I'm opening an investigation in the United States in a terrorism matter or an intelligence matter or a criminal matter, and I have a name of the suspect and their telephone number and their email addresses, I search the FBI's databases. That search necessarily will also touch the information that was collected under 702 so that we don't miss a dot, but nobody gets access to the information that sits in the 702 database unless they've been trained correctly. If there is, let's imagine that terrorists overseas were talking about a suspect in the United States or someone's email address in the United States was in touch with that terrorist. And that information sits in the 702 database. When we open the case in the United States and put in that name and that email address, it will touch that data and tell us there's information in the 702 database that's relevant. If the agent doing the query is properly trained on how to handle that, he or she will be able to see that information. If they're not properly trained, they'll be alerted that there is information. Then they have to go get the appropriate training and the appropriate oversight to be able to see it. But to do it otherwise is to risk us, where it matters most, in the United States, failing to connect dots. So my view is the information that's in the 702 database has been lawfully collected, carefully overseen and checked, and our use of it is also appropriate and carefully overseen and checked. So you are not masking the data, unmasking the data? I'm not sure what that means in this context. What we do is we combine information collected from any lawful source in a single FBI database so we don't miss a dot when we're conducting investigations in the United States. What we make sure, though, is nobody gets to see FISA information of any kind unless they've had the appropriate training and have the appropriate oversight. My time is up. Thank you. Senator Hatch. Well, thank you, uh, Senator. Dr. Director Comey, in January, I introduced the uh, S-139, the Rapid DNA Act. Its bipartisan uh, co-sponsors include Senators Feinstein, Cornyn, Coons, Flake, Klobuchar, and Lee on this committee, and maybe more. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for putting this bill on the agenda for tomorrow's business meeting. Uh, and this is the same bill that the Senate unanimously passed last year, and this technology allows developing a DNA profile and performing database comparisons in less than two hours. Following standards and procedures approved by the FBI, it would allow law enforcement to solve crimes and innocent advocates to exonerate the wrongfully accused. Now, Mr. Director, you came before this committee in December 2015 and I ask you then about this legislation. You said it would, quote, help us change the world in a very, very exciting way, unquote. Is that still your view of the value of this legislation? And do you believe that Congress should enact it on its own without getting tangled up in other criminal justice reform issues? I agree very much, Senator Hatch, that rapid DNA will materially advance the safety of the American people so that if a police officer somewhere in the United States has in his or her custody someone who is a rapist, before letting them go on some lesser offense, they'll be able to quickly check a DNA database and get a hit. That will save lives. That will protect all kinds of people from pain. And I think it's a great thing. Well, thank you. Your prepared statement touches on what the FBI is doing to protect children from predators. Personnel and youth serving organizations such as employees, coaches, or volunteers often work with unsupervised, uh, or with uh, youth unsupervised. 
That magnifies the need for uh, thorough evaluating and vetting at the time they join such organizations. Along with Senators Franken and Klobuchar, I introduced the Child Protection Improvement Act, which gives youth-serving organizations greater access to the nationwide FBI fingerprint background check system. Now, do you believe that providing organizations like the YMCA and the Girl Scouts of America greater access to FBI fingerprint background checks is an important step in keeping child predators and violent criminals away from our children? I do, Senator. I don't know enough about the legislation to react, but I think the more information you can put in the hands of the people who are vetting people who are going to be near children, the better. We have an exciting new feature of the FBI's uh, fingerprint system called Wrapback, that once you check someone's identification, check them to see if they have no record. If they later develop one, you can be alerted to it if it happens thereafter, which I think makes a big difference. Well, thank you. You've spoken at length about the so-called going dark program. <clears throat> whereby strong encryption technology hinders the ability of law enforcement to access communication and other personal, uh, personal data on smartphones and similar devices. Your prepared testimony for today's hearing addresses this issue as well. Now, I've expressed uh, significant concern about proposals that would require device or software manufacturers to build a backdoor into their programming to allow law enforcement to access encrypted data in the course of investigations. Now, I remain convinced that such back doors can be created without seriously compromising the, uh, the uh, security of encrypted devices. Now, I believe this is an issue where law enforcement and stakeholders need to work together to find solutions rather than coming to Congress with one-size-fits-all legislative fixes. Uh, what are you doing to engage with stakeholders on this issue, and what kind of progress are you making, if you could tell us? Thank you, Senator. I think there's good news on that front. We've had very good, open, and productive conversations with the private sector over the last 18 months about this issue, because everybody realizes we care about the same things. We all love privacy. We all care about public safety. And none of us, at least the people that I hang around with, do, none of us want back doors. We don't want access to devices built in in some way. What we want to work with the manufacturers on is to figure out how can we accommodate both interests in a sensible way? How can we optimize the privacy, uh, security features of their devices, and allow court orders to be complied with? We're having some good conversations. I don't know where they're going to end up, frankly. I, I could imagine a world that ends up with legislation saying, if you're going to make devices in the United States, you figure out how to comply with court orders, or maybe we don't go there. Uh, but we are having productive conversations right now, I think. Great. Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act is up for reauthorization this year. We now have almost a decade of experience using this statute, so we have much more to go on than simply speculation or theory. Now, the intelligence value of Section 702 is well documented, and it has never been intentionally misused or abused. Every federal court, including the FISA court, that has addressed the issue has concluded that Section 702 is lawful. Administrations of both parties have strongly supported it. Describe for us the targeting and minimization procedures that Section 702 requires and how each agency's procedures are subject to oversight within the executive branch. Oh, thank you, Senator. As I said in my opening, 702 is a critical tool to protect this country. And the way it works is we are allowed to conduct surveillance, again, under the supervision of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, on non-U.S. persons who are outside the United States, if they're using American infrastructure, an email system in the United States, a phone system in the United States. So it doesn't involve U.S. persons, and it doesn't involve activity in the United States. And then each agency, as you said, has detailed procedures for how we will handle this information that are approved by the FISA court and so become court orders that, that govern us. But not only are we overseen by the FISA court, we're overseen by our inspectors general and by Congress checking on our work. And you're exactly correct. There have been no abuses. Every court that has looked at this has said this is appropriate under the Fourth Amendment. This is appropriate under the statute. It was an act passed by a democratically controlled Congress for a Republican president, then renewed 
by a Republican-controlled Congress for a Democratic president and upheld by every court that's looked at it. And, and I'm telling you what the rest of the intelligence community has said. We need this to protect the country. This should be an easy conversation to have, but often people get confused about the details and mix it up with other things. So it's our job to make sure we explain it clearly. Well, thank you. My time is up. Senator Leahy, I'll turn to you. Thank you. Uh, welcome back, Director Comey. You mentioned you like these annual uh, meetings. Of course, we didn't have an annual meeting last year. It's been, uh, I think, last year was the first time in 15 years that the FBI did not testify before this committee. But there's been a lot that's happened that last year and a half, as been noted. Um, Senator Feinstein noted that uh, Americans across the, uh, the country have been confused and disappointed by your judgment in handling the investigation into Secretary Clinton's emails. Uh, on a number of occasions, you chose to comment directly and extensively on that investigation. You even released internal FBI memos and interview notes. I may have missed this, but in my 42 years here, I've never seen anything like that. But you said absolutely nothing regarding the investigation into the Trump campaign's connections to Russia's illegal efforts to help elect Donald Trump. Um, was it appropriate for you to comment on one investigation repeatedly and not say anything about the other? I think so. Can I explain, Senator? Uh, Department I only have so much time. Okay, I'll be quick. The Department, I think I treated both investigations consistently under the same principles. People forget, we would not confirm the existence of the Hillary Clinton email investigation until three months after it began, even though it began with a public referral and the candidate herself talked about it. In October of 2015, we confirmed it existed and then said not another word, not a peep about until, it, until, until we were finished. Until the critical time possible, a couple weeks before the election. And I think there are other things involved in that election, I'll, I'll, I'll grant that. But there's no question uh, that that had a great effect. Historians can debate what kind of an effect it was. But you, uh, you did do it. Uh, the, uh, in October, the FBI was investigating the Trump campaign's connection to Russia. You sent a letter informing the Senate and House that you were reviewing additional emails. It could be relevant to this, but both investigations were open, but you still only commented on one. I commented, as I explained earlier, on October 28th in a letter that I sent to the chair and rankings of the oversight committees that we were taking additional steps in the Clinton email investigation because I had testified under oath repeatedly that we were done, that we were finished there. With respect to the Russia investigation, we treated it like we did with the Clinton investigation. We didn't say a word about it until months into it. And then the only thing we've confirmed so far about this is the same thing with the Clinton investigation, that we are investigating. And I would expect we're not going to say another peep about it until we're done. And I don't know what will be said when we're done, but that's the way we handled the Clinton investigation as let me, well. Let me ask you this. Um, during your investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails, a number of surrogates, like Rudy Giuliani, claimed to have a pipeline to the FBI. He boasted that, and I quote, numerous agents talked to him all the time, close quote, regarding the investigation. He even said that he had insinuated he had advanced warning about the emails described in your October letter. Former FBI agent Jim Kallstrom made similar claims. Now, either lying or there's a serious problem within the bureau Did anybody in the fbi during this 2016 campaign have contact with rudy giuliani about um about the clinton investigation i don't know yet but if i find out that people were leaking information about our investigations whether to reporters or to private parties there'll be severe consequences did you know of anything from jim calstrom same answer. I don't know yet. You know anything about from other former agents? I don't know yet. But it's a matter that I'm very, very interested in. But you are looking into it? Correct. 
And once you have found that answer, will you provide it to us? I'll provide it to the committee in some form. I don't know whether I would say it publicly, but I'd find some way to let, let you know. Okay. Now, there are reports that a number of the senior officials in the Trump campaign administration are connected to the Russian investigation. In fact, the Attorney General was forced to recuse himself. Now, many members of this committee have urged the Deputy Attorney General, and he has that authority, to appoint a special counsel to protect the independence of the investigation. I recall I was here in December 2003, shortly after you were confirmed as Deputy Attorney General, then Attorney General Ashcroft recused himself from the investigation into the Valerie Plame leak. You immediately appointed special counsel, I believe you appointed Patrick uh, Fitzgerald. Uh, what led you to that decision? In that particular investigation, my judgment was that, it, that the appearance of uh, fairness and independence required that it be removed from the political chain of command within the Department of Justice because, as you'll recall, it seems like a lifetime ago, but that, also, that involved the conduct of people who were senior level people in the White House. And my judgment was that even I, um, as an independent-minded person, was a political appointee, and so I ought to give it to a career person like Pat Fitzgerald. Well, what about the situation now? We have a Deputy Attorney General. I voted uh, for his confirmation, but shouldn't he be not the one to be investigating campaign uh, contacts when his boss, the attorney general, was a central figure in that campaign? That's a judgment he'll have to make. He is, as I hoped I was as deputy attorney general, a very independent-minded, career-oriented person, but it'd be premature for me to comment on that. Past weekend, President Trump again said the hacking of the DNC and other efforts to influence the election could have been China, could have been a lot of different groups. Is that contrary to what the intelligence com uh, community has said? The intelligence community, with high confidence, concluded it was Russia. In many circumstances, it's hard to do attribution of a hack, but sometimes the intelligence is there. We have high confidence that the North Koreans hacked Sony. We have high confidence that the Russians did the hacking of the DNC and the other organizations. I have a lot of other questions which I'll submit, but I, before it sounds totally uh, negative, I want to praise the response of the FBI in South Burlington, Vermont. We had had uh, anonymous uh, Emails coming in threatening uh, serious action against students in a high school, escalating cyber threats, including detailed death threats, multiple lockdowns and all. The FBI worked closely with the Champlain College's Leahy Center for Digital Investigation, which you visited a couple of years ago. It was a textbook example of collaboration between uh, state, local, and federal authorities. And I want to thank all those who turned out to be a very disturbed young man who was doing it. But you only have to turn on the TV and see what happens in different parts of the country, how worried we were in Vermont. I just want to thank your FBI thank you. agents for their help. Thank you for that, Senator. Uh, Senator Graham would be next, so we'll go to Senator Cornyn. Thank you. Good morning, Director Good morning, Comey. Sir. I'm uh, disappointed to see that Former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was in the news yesterday, essentially blaming you and blaming everything other than herself for her loss on November the 8th. I find it ironic because you're not the one who made the decision to handle classified information on a private email server. Um, you're not the one who decided to have a private meeting with Secretary Clinton's husband in the middle of the Justice Department's ongoing investigation into Secretary Clinton's server. I use the word investigation here because according to a recent piece in the New York Times, you were forbidden from using the word investigation and were instead told to refer to the investigation, which it was, as a matter. Of course, it was the former Attorney General Loretta Lynch who up until that meeting with President Clinton was the person responsible for making the decision whether to uh, convene a grand jury uh, involving the allegations against Secretary Clinton. And it was former Attorney General L L Loretta Lynch who apparently forbade you from using the word investigation. Indeed, if 
the New York Times story is true, a Democratic operative expressed confidence that the former Attorney General would keep that investigation from going very far. I think you were given an, an impossible uh, choice to make, and you did the best you could in light of the situation um, that you were presented with. And it, it strikes me as somewhat sad uh, for people here and elsewhere uh, to condemn you for notifying Congress shortly before the election that you'd uncovered even more emails related to the investigation, including classified emails, again, um, because Secretary Clinton had made the decision to use a private email server. And I think it's important to remind folks that you are not the one who decided to do business this way and keep State Department emails on a computer of someone suspected of child pornography. Again, I believe you were placed in an incredibly difficult position. You did the best you could. You may recall I was one of those who felt like, given the nature of the investigation and the concerns, that a special counsel uh, should have been appointed to conduct the investigation. But of course, uh, Attorney General Lynch and the Obama administration uh, opposed that effort. So I just wanted to express to you my, my disappointment at uh, uh, this continued seeking of a reason, any reason other than the flawed campaign and the candidate herself uh, for Secretary Clinton losing uh, the presidential election. If I can turn to a couple of other um, substantive items here, I, you've mentioned 702 of FISA in the reauthorization, and I believe you've referred to this as the crown jewels of uh, the FBI and of counterterrorism uh, investigations. Could you explain why this provides such a unique uh, tool and why you regard it as literally the crown jewels of, uh, of the FBI? Thank you, Senator. The, every time I talk about this publicly, I wince a little bit because I don't want bad people around the world to focus on this too much. But really bad people around the world, because of the genius of American innovation, use our products and infrastructure for their emails, for their communications. And what 702 allows us to do is quickly target terrorists, weapons of mass destruction, proliferators, spies, cyber hackers, non-Americans, who are using our infrastructure to communicate, to target them quickly and collect information on them. And it is vital to all parts of the intelligence community because of its agility, its speed, and its effectiveness. And again, in an open setting, we can't explain what you already know from classified briefings about what a difference this makes. But again, because America is the mother of all this innovation, they use a lot of our equipment, a lot of our networks to communicate with each other. If we were ever required to establish the normal warrant process for these non-Americans who aren't in our country just because the photons they're using to plan attacks cross our country's lands, we'd be tying ourselves in knots for reasons that make no sense at all and the courts have said are unnecessary under the Fourth Amendment. So this is a tool. We talked a lot last year about the telephony metadata database. I think that's a useful tool. It does not compare in importance to 702. We can't lose 702. Well, I, I agree, and it is a little bit um, difficult to talk about things that do involve classified matters in public, but I think the public needs to know uh, that there are multiple uh, oversight layers, including the FISA court, uh, congressional oversight, internal oversight within the FBI and intelligence community that protects Americans from uh, and under their, uh, their privacy rights while targeting um, terrorists and people who are trying to kill us. I want to talk a minute about the electronic communication transactional records, something you and I have discussed before as well. The FBI can use national security letters, I believe, to get financial information and, and telephone numbers now in the conduct of a uh, terrorist investigation, but because of a typo in the law, um, the FBI has not been allowed access to internet metadata in national security cases. Uh, to the extent that, uh, that is necessary. Uh, can you talk to us about the importance of that particular fix, the Electronic Communications Transactional Records Fix or ECTA yeah. fix? Yeah, thank you so much, Senator. This seems like a boring deal. This makes a big impact on our work, and here's why. In our counterterrorism cases and our counterintelligence cases, we can issue, with all kinds of, of layers of approval in the FBI, a national security letter 
to find out the subscriber to a particular telephone number and to find out what numbers that telephone number was in contact with. Not the content of those communications, but just the, the connection. Again, because of what I believe is a typo in the law, and if I'm wrong, Congress will tell me that, that they intended this, the companies that provide the same services but on the internet resist and say, we don't have the statutory authority to serve an NSL national security letter to find out the subscriber to a particular email handle or what addresses were in contact with what addresses. Although we could do the same with telephone communications. I don't think Congress intended that distinction, but what it does to us is, in our most important investigations, it requires us, if we want to find out the subscriber to a particular uh, email handle, to go and get an order from a federal judge in Washington as part of the FISA court, an incredibly long and difficult process. And I'm worried about that slowing us down, but also worried about it becoming a disincentive for our investigators to do it at all. Because if you're working a case in, in San Antonio or in Seattle, you're moving very, very quickly. And if I have to go to get subscriber information, for heaven's sakes, on an email address to a federal court in Washington, I'm probably going to try and find some other way around it. If that's what Congress wants, sure, we'll follow the law. I don't think that was ever intended. And so I would hope that Congress will fix what I believe is a typo. Thank you, Mr. Director. I have other questions uh, for the record. Thank you. are uh, going over to vote now. And I'd also like to have both Democrat and Republicans notify me if they want a second round so I can get an uh, inventory of that. Uh, Senator Klobuchar. Thank you. Welcome back, Director Comey. Um, as you are well aware, Russia is actively working to undermine our democracy and hurt American businesses at the same time. Uh, now more than ever, Americans are looking uh, to Congress for leadership, and we must be a united front. And I've appreciated uh, some of the members of this committee on the Republican side who have spoken out about this. Uh, we must be united as we seek information from the administration. Uh, last month during a hearing at the House Intelligence Committee, you confirmed that the FBI is investigating the Russian government's efforts to interfere in the 2016 presidential election. Um, including any links between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. I know that you cannot discuss that ongoing investigation, but just one question to clarify. Will you commit to ensuring that the relevant congressional committees receive a full and timely briefing on that investigation's findings? In general, I can, Senator. I need Department of Justice approval to brief on particular people that we're investigating. We've briefed the chairs and the rankings, including of this committee, on who we have cases open on and exactly what we're doing and how we're using various sources of information. I don't know whether the department will approve that for the entire intelligence committees, but I'll lean as far forward as I can. And then because um, Sen uh, Attorney General Sessions is recused from that and now Rod Rosenstein is approved, do you go to him then to get that approval? Yes, I've already briefed him. I think his first day in office, I briefed him on where we are, and so he would be the person to make that decision. Thank you. Uh, in your testimony, you note that the Justice Department brought charges against Russian spies and criminal hackers in connection with the 2014 Yahoo cyber attack in February, an example of a cyber attack in our economy. In December of 2016, the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security released a 13-page report providing technical details about how federal investigators linked Russia to the hacks against U.S. political organizations. Does Russia use the same military and civilian tools it used to hack our political organizations in order to do things like hack into U.S. companies, steal identities, and sell the credit card information of Americans on the black market? And how is the FBI working to fight against hackers supported by foreign governments like Russia? The answer is yes. Both their government organizations and then they have a relationship it's often difficult to define with criminals, and that the Yahoo hack is actually an example of that. You had some of the Russia's greatest criminal hackers and intelligence agency hackers working together. So the answer is yes. Um, and what we're doing is trying to see if we can impose costs on that behavior in a lot of different ways, but including one I mentioned in my opening, which is locking up people. If we can get them outside of Russia, Russia is not too great about cooperating with us when there are criminals inside their borders. 
but all of them like to travel, and so if they travel grabbing them and, and, and locking them, putting handcuffs on them to send a message that that's not a freebie. Uh, in your testimony, you also discuss the threat that transnational organized crime poses to our safety and our security. Uh, Russia has vast criminal networks that the Kremlin uses to sow instability across the world. I heard these concerns firsthand when Senator Graham and McCain and I uh, were in the Baltics, Ukraine, and Georgia. Uh, there have been recent concerns that organized criminals, including Russians, are using the luxury real estate market to launder money. The Treasury Department has noted a significant rise in the use of shell companies in real estate transactions because foreign buyers use them as a way to hide their identity and find a safe haven for their money in the U.S. In fact, nearly half of all homes in the U.S. worth at least $5 million are purchased using shell companies. Does the anonymity associated with the use of shell companies to buy real estate hurt the FBI's ability to trace the flow of illicit money and fight organized crime? And do you support efforts by the Treasury Department to use its existing authority to require more transparency in these transactions? Yes and yes. Okay, very good, because I think this is a huge problem. When you hear that over $5 million homes, half of them uh, purchased by shell, shell companies, uh, that is a major problem. In March, uh, this committee, Subcommittee on Crime and Terrorism held its first hearing. I thank Senator Graham and uh, Senator Whitehouse for that. I raised the issue of protecting our election infrastructure uh, with former Bush Department of Justice official Ken Weinstein, and he agreed that this is a very important issue. As a ranking, as the ranking member of the Rules Committee, I'm particularly concerned about ensuring our elections are safe from foreign interference. I recently led a group of 26 senators in calling for a full account of the Election Assistance Commission's efforts to address Russian cybersecurity threats in the 2016 election. I'm also working on legislation in this area. Can you discuss how the FBI has coordinated with the Election Assistance Commission, Department of Homeland Security, and state and local election officials to help protect the integrity of our election process. Thank you, Senator. In short, what we've done with DHS is share the tools, tactics, and techniques we see hackers, especially from the 2016 election season, using to attack uh, voter registration databases and, and try and engage in other hacks. And we've pushed that out to all the states and to the Election Assistance Commission so they can harden their networks. That's one of the most important things we can do is equip them with the information to make their systems tighter. Very good, because as you know, we have uh, different equipment all over this country. Um, there's some advantage to that, I think. I think it's good when we have paper ballot backups, of course, uh, but we have to be prepared for this. And this certainly isn't about one political party uh, or one candidate. Uh, last, uh, the last time you came before the committee in December uh, 2015, just one week after the San Bernardino attacks, uh, since then, as was noted uh, by the chair, uh, we've seen other attacks in our country. Um, we had an, a, a, a tragedy in a shopping mall in St. Cloud, Minnesota, 10 wounded at a shopping mall. Thankfully, a uh, brave off-duty cop was there. He was able uh, to stop further damage uh, from being done. Um, and I would also like to thank you and the FBI for your investigation. Having talked to the chief up there, uh, Senator Franken and I were briefed uh, by him, as well as Congressman Emmer, um, right after this attack. Um, the local police department is a mid-sized department, and they had to do a lot with working with the community. They have a significant Somali community there that's a big part of their community that they're proud to have there. So they're working with them. Uh, they're working with the community. They're helping. But the FBI really stood in and did the investigation. Um, and I guess I want to thank you for that and just end with one question. It's been reported uh, that ISIS has encouraged lone wolf attacks, uh, like what we saw in Orlando. It's murkier, the facts in St. Cloud. Uh, what challenges do these type of attacks present for law enforcement, and what is the FBI doing to prevent these kinds of tragedies? Yeah, the central, thank you, Senator. The central challenge is not just finding needles in a nationwide haystack, but trying to figure out which pieces of hay might become a needle. And that is which of the troubled young people, or sometimes it's older people, are consuming poisonous propaganda, some ISIS, some Anwar Laki, some other sources, and are moving towards thinking an act of violence like a stabbing at a shopping mall is some way to achieve meaning in their lives. 
And a huge part of it is building relationships with the communities you mentioned, because those folks do not want anyone committing violence, committing violence in the name of their faith. And so they have the same incentives we do, and making sure they see us that way and we see them that way is at the heart of our response. Because we're not going to see some troubled kid going sideways and thinking he should stab people anywhere near as easily as the people around that kid are going to see it. And so getting in a position where they feel comfortable telling us or telling local law enforcement is at the heart of our ability to, to find those needles, evaluate those pieces of hay, and stop this. Appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Graham. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Director Cummings, could you pass on to your agents and all support personnel how much we appreciate their efforts to defend the country? We're going to set a uh, record for questions asked and answered in six minutes and 54 seconds, if I can. Do you agree with me if sequestration goes back into effect next year, it would be devastating to the FBI? Yes. And it's due to do so unless Congress changes it? That's, I've, I've been told that. Okay. Do you agree with me that ISIL uh, loses the caliphate? These people will go out throughout the world and become terrorist agents, and the threat of terrorism to the homeland is going to get greater over time, not smaller. Yes. It, it'll diminish in that the, their power to put out their media to the troubled people in the country will decrease, but the, the hardened killers flowing out of the caliphate will be a big problem. So from a funding point of view, terrorism is not going to get better. It's probably going to get worse. I think that's fair to say. Uh, did you ever talk to Sally Yates about her concerns about uh, General Flynn being compromised? I did. I don't know whether I can talk about it um, in this forum, but yet the answer is yes. That she had concerns about General Flynn and she expressed those concerns to you? Correct. Okay. We'll talk about that later. Do you stand by your House testimony on March 20th that there was no surveillance of the Trump campaign that you're aware of? Correct. You would know about it if they were, is that correct? I think so, yes. Okay. Uh, Carter Page, was there a FISA warrant issued regarding Carter Page's activity with the Russians? I can't answer that here. Did you consider Carter Page a agent of the campaign? Same answer. Can't answer that here. Okay. Uh, do you stand by your testimony that there is an active investigation counterintelligence investigation regarding Trump campaign individuals in the Russian government as to whether or not they collaborate. You said that in March. Is to that see if there true? was any coordination yeah. between the Russian yeah. effort and, right. and people. Is that still going on? Yes. Okay, so nothing's changed. You stand by those two statements. Correct. But you won't tell me about Carter Page. Not here, I won't. Okay. Uh, the chairman mentioned that Fusion, uh, are you familiar with Fusion? I know the name. Okay. Are they part of the Russian intelligence apparatus? I can't say. Okay. Do you agree with me that if Fusion was involved in preparing a dossier against Donald Trump, that would be interfering in our election by the Russians? I, I, I don't want to say. Okay. Do you agree with me that Anthony Weiner of 2016 should not have access to classified information? Uh, Yes, that's a fair statement. Would you agree with me that if that's not illegal, we've got really bad laws? Well, if he hadn't... It, well, it would, he got it somehow. It would be illegal if he didn't have appropriate clearance. Well, do you agree with me he didn't have appropriate clearance? He did. If he did have appropriate clearance, that would even be worse. I don't believe at the time we found that on his laptop that he had any kind of clearance. Yeah, I agree. So for him to get it should be a crime. Somebody should be prosecuted for letting Anthony Weiner have access to classified, classified information. Does that make general sense? It could be a crime. It would depend upon what the people... Well, do you want. agree with me? It should be. <laughs> that anybody that lets Anthony Weiner have classified information probably should be prosecuted. Well, if our laws don't cover that, they probably should. There's no Anthony Weiner statute, but it is... There's already okay. a statute. <laughs> well, maybe we need one. There's okay. already a statute. All right, good. There's I already just, a statute. I just wonder it. how you can get classified information and not be a crime by somebody. Uh, unmasking, are you familiar with that? I'm familiar with that term. Okay, has the Bureau ever requested unmasking of an American citizen caught up in incidental collection? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I did it this and, week in connection with an intelligence report. All right, before I authorize, reauthorize 702, and I'm a pretty hawkish guy, I want to know how unmasking works. Are you aware of any requests by the White House? anybody in the Obama administration to unmask American citizens that were caught up in incidental surveillances in 2015 or 2016? 
I'm not. I'm not aware of any request to the FBI. Would you know? What they, who would they make the request to? Well, they could make it to, to anyone in the FBI who was... Uh, what about the NSA? Wouldn't you make it to the NSA? Sure, if it was an NSA report. Okay. I, and I've read in the media and heard about NSA reports. When you ask for unmasking, who do you ask? Do you go to the NSA to ask that somebody be unmasked? When I want, for example, I'll give you an example. I got a report this week that said uh, U.S. company number one right. and had been removed. And I said, I believe I need to know the name of that company. Who do you ask? So I ask my intelligence briefer who works okay. for the PDB staff, say, I'd like to know that. And then she goes and asks the owner of the information. Which the, would be the NSA? Well, in this case, I think it was CIA information okay. saying the director. Does the owner of the information record requests for unmasking? I believe the NSA does, CIA, I don't know about CSA, NSA definitely does. But there should be a record somewhere in our government for a request to unmask, regardless of who made the request. I think that's right. Uh, is it fair to say that very few people can make requests for unmasking? I mean, it's, I can't go and make that request as a senator, can I? Sure, it's a fairly small group, the, the consumers, which I am, yeah. of that uh, Small set Is the of National Security Council within that group that can make this request, or do you know? I don't know for sure. I think the National Security Advisor certainly can. Okay. Uh, when it comes to Russia, is it fair to say that the government of Russia actively provides safe haven to cyber criminals? Yes. Is it fair to say that the Russian government is still involved in American politics? Yes. Is it fair to say we need to stop them from doing this? <laughs> Yes, fair to say. Do you agree with me the only way they're going to stop is for them to pay a price for interfering in our political process? I think that's a fair statement. Yeah, okay. So what we're doing today is not working. They're still doing it. They're doing it all over the world, aren't they? Yes. So what kind of threat do you believe Russia presents to our democratic process, given what you know about Russia's behavior of late? Well, certainly, the, in my view, the greatest threat of any nation on Earth uh, given their intention and their capability. Uh, do you agree that they did not change the actual vote tally, but one day they might? I agree that I, very much we found no indication of any change in vote tallies. Uh, there was efforts aimed at voter registration systems, but I suppose in theory, hard in the United States, the, the beauty of our system is it's a bit of a hairball, and all different kinds of systems and, and you know, elderly. Have they done this in other countries where they actually tampered with the vote? My, my understanding is they have attempted it in other countries. And there's no reason they won't attempt it here if we don't stop them over time. I think that's fair. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Welcome back, Director Comey. What is the policy of the Department and the Bureau regarding the release of derogatory investigative information about an uncharged subject? Uh, the general practice is we don't talk about uh, completed investigations that didn't result in charges as a general matter. And what is the policy regarding release of derogatory information about charged subjects beyond the derogatory investigative information disclosed either in the charging document or in further court proceedings? Well, I think you summarized it. The gist of the policy is you don't want to do anything outside the charging documents or the public record that might prejudice the trial proceeding. And one of the reasons you do that is if you had a police chief say, uh, we have investigated the contract between the mayor and the contractor, and we've decided there were no misdeeds, but we found out that the mayor was sleeping with her driver, just wanted to let you know that, that would be kind of a blow to the integrity of the prosecutor function and uh, would probably tend to uh, diminish support for the prosecutor function if it were played by those rules, correct? I think that's fair. That's why the policy exists. Yep. Um, with respect to uh, oversight questions, let's hypothesize that an investigation exists and that the public knows about it, which could happen for a great number of legitimate reasons. What questions are appropriate for senators to ask about that investigation in their oversight capacity? Well, they can ask anything they want. What, uh, what, are, what questions are appropriate for you to answer? Uh, very few, while a matter is pending, um, and While we know it's pending, is it appropriate for you to tell us whether it's adequately resourced and to ask questions about, uh, for instance, are there actually agents assigned to this or has this been put in somebody's bottom drawer? 
Sure, potentially, right. And How's it being supervised? Who's working on it? That sort of thing. And are there benchmarks in certain types of cases where departmental approvals are required or uh, the involvement of certain department officials is required to see whether those steps have actually been taken? I'm not sure I'm following the question. I'm sorry. Well, let's say you've got a hypothetically a RICO investigation and it has to go through procedures within the department oh. necessary to allow a RICO uh, investigation to proceed. If none of those have ever been invoked or implicated, that would send a signal that maybe not much effort has been dedicated to it. Would that be a legitimate question to ask? Have these, again, you'd have to know that it was a RICO investigation, but assuming that we knew that that was the case, would those staging elements as an investigation moves forward in the internal department approvals be appropriate for us to ask about and you to answer about? Yeah, it, um that's a harder question. I'm not sure it would be appropriate to answer it because it would give away uh, what we were looking at uh, potentially. Would it be appropriate to ask if uh, whether any, any witnesses have been uh, interviewed or whether any documents have been obtained pursuant to the investigation? Uh, that's, that's also a harder one. I'd be reluctant to answer questions like that because it's a slippery slope uh, to giving away information about exactly what you're doing. But if we're concerned that investigation gets put on the shelf and not taken seriously, the fact that no witnesses have been called and no documents have been sought would be pretty relevant and wouldn't reveal anything other than a lack of attention by the Bureau, correct? It could, but we're very careful about revealing how we might use a grand jury, for example. And so if we start answering... Well, you've got 6E. I understand that. Yeah. This is a separate thing. Yeah. So that's a harder call. Well, we'll pursue it. Okay. Uh, what um, is the department's or the Bureau's policy regarding witnesses who are uh, cooperating in investigation who have some form of ongoing compliance problem? Let's say they haven't paid their taxes for the last year. Is it the policy of the Department or the Bureau that they should get those co cooperating witnesses to clean up their act so that their non-compliance does not become an issue later on in the case? Uh, yes. I don't know whether it's a written – I know I should know this. I can't remember sitting here whether it's a written policy. It's certainly a long-standing practice. practice. Long-standing yeah. practice, exactly. Um, when are tax returns useful in investigating a criminal offense? Well, they're useful in showing uh, unreported income, uh, motive. If someone hides something that should otherwise be on a tax return, it indicates they might know it was criminal activity. It's not uncommon to seek and use tax returns in a criminal investigation. Not uncommon. It's, it's a very difficult process, as it should be, but it, especially in complex financial uh, cases, it's a relatively common tool. Um, the hearing that Senator Graham and I held with respect to uh, Russia's infiltration and influence in the last election uh, raised the issue of um, Russia intervening with business leaders in a country, engaging them in bribery or other highly favorable business deals with a view to either recruiting them as somebody who has been bribed or being able to threaten them by disclosing the illicit relationship, they're perfectly happy to blow up their own cutout, but it also blows up the individual. Have you seen any indication that those are uh, Russian strategies in their election influence toolbox? In general, my, in general. Under my understanding is those are tools that the Russians have used over many decades. And um, lastly, um, the European Union is moving towards requiring transparency of incorporations so that shell corporations are harder to create. That risks leaving the United States as the last big haven for shell corporations. Is it true that shell corporations are often used as a device for criminal money laundering? Yes. Is it true that shell corporations are also often used as a device for the concealment of criminally garnered funds? Yes. And to avoid legitimate taxation? Yes. Uh, what do you think the hazards are for the United States with respect to election interference of continuing to maintain a system in which shell corporations uh, that you never know who's really behind them are commonplace? I suppose one risk is that it makes it easier for illicit money to make its way into a, a political environment. And that's not a good thing. 
I, I don't think it is. Yeah, me neither. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Director, thank you for being here. Uh, given the FBI's extensive responsibilities and expertise in cyber and counterintelligence investigations, how likely do you think it is that Senate IT systems have been targeted by foreign intelligence services? services? I would estimate it's a certainty. And inside the IC, who, who would talk about that problem and who at the Senate would they inform? Well, there have been a key. I don't want to talk about particular matters, but it, it often is the FBI alerting a U.S. government institution or private sector. A DHS might come across it or, or other parts of the intelligence community, especially NSA. When, uh, when we talk about things like cyber investigations right now, so often on cable TV it becomes a shirts and skins exercise. So without asking you to comment about anything that's retrospective about 2016, do you think it's likely that in 2018 and beyond you're going to see more targeting of U.S. Um, public discourse and elections? I do. I, I think one of the lessons uh, that particularly the Russians may have drawn from this is that this works. And so, as I said last a month or so ago, I expect to see them back in 2018, especially in 2020. You regularly testify, and correct me if, I, if I've misheard, misheard you, but I think you've regularly testified that you don't think the Bureau is short of resources. You don't come before us and make big uh, increased appropriations requests. And yet, uh, those of us who are very concerned about cyber look at the U.S. government writ large and think we're not at all prepared for the future. Can you tell us what the FBI is doing to prepare for that 2018 and 2020 uh, circumstance that you envision? Um, without giving too much detail, uh, we have an enormous part of the FBI in our counterintelligence division and in our cyber division that focuses on just that threat and making sure that we do everything we can to understand how the bad guys might come at us. And as I talked about earlier, to equip the civilian agencies that are responsible for hardening our infrastructure with all the information we have about how they're going to come at us. And if you had in your national security domain uh, increased resources, how would you spend another marginal dollar beyond what you expect to receive now? I'd probably uh, have a tie between investing more in upgrading our systems to make sure we're keeping pace with the bar of excellence and probably to hire additional cyber agents and analysts. And if you had your druthers, uh, what kind of increased funding request would you make? Uh, I wouldn't make any sitting here. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about WikiLeaks. Uh, in January, the FBI contributed to an IC assessment that concluded that WikiLeaks is a known outlet of foreign propaganda. Do you stand by that assessment? Yes. Do you believe that WikiLeaks has released sensitive and classified information? Yes. Do you believe any of WikiLeaks' disclosures have endangered American lives and or put at risk American interests? I believe that both have been the result of some of their releases. Can you help me understand why Julian Assange has not been charged with a crime? Well, I don't want to comment on the particular case because I don't want to confirm whether or not uh, there are charges pending. He hasn't been apprehended because he's inside the Ecuadorian embassy in London. I uh, sent a letter to the Attorney General a number of weeks ago, asking questions about the status of the investigation. And it seemed pretty clear, though individuals were polite and kind and responsive to our request, it seemed that across the IC there wasn't much deliberation uh, about WikiLeaks and about Julian Assange. And this question, is the FBI participating in any interagency dialogue about whether or not Assange has committed crimes? I don't know where you got that impression, but WikiLeaks uh, is an important focus of our attention. Um, I intentionally left the almost half of my time for you to sort of wax broadly for a minute. Uh, there is room for reasonable people to disagree about at what point an allegedly journalistic organization crosses a, a line to become some sort of a tool of foreign intelligence. There are Americans, well-meaning, thoughtful people, who think that WikiLeaks might just be a journalistic outfit. Can you explain why that is not your view? Yeah, and again, I want to be uh, careful that I don't prejudice any future proceeding. Uh, it, it's an important question because all of us care deeply about the First Amendment and the ability of a free press to get information about our work and, and publish it. To my mind, it crosses a line when it moves from being about trying to educate a public and instead just becomes about intelligence porn, frankly, just pushing out information about sources and methods without regard to um, 
interest without regard to uh, the First Amendment values that normally underlie press reporting and simply becomes a conduit for the Russian intelligence services or some other adversary of the United States just to push out information to damage the United States. And I realize reasonable people, as you said, struggle to draw a line, but surely there's conduct that's so far to the side of that line that we can all agree there's nothing that even smells journalist about some of this conduct. So if, if you could map that continuum, there are clearly members of the IC that have at different points in the past leaked classified information. That is an illegal act, correct? Correct. When American journalists court and solicit that information, have they violated any law by asking people in the IC to potentially leak, to leak information that is potentially classified? That conduct is not treated by the U.S. government as criminal conduct. Now, I've been asked in other contexts, isn't it true that the espionage statute has no carve-out uh, for journalists? That's true. But at least in my lifetime, the Department of Justice's view has been news gathering and legitimate news reporting is not covered, is not going to be investigated or prosecuted as a criminal act. That's how it's thought of. So uh, an investigative reporter taking advantage of and celebrating the liberties that we have under the First Amendment at the Washington Post or at the Omaha World Herald or at the Lincoln Journal Star or at the New York Times, trying to talk to people in the IC and get the maximum amount of information that they possibly can out of them to inform the public. It is not the burden of an American journalist to discern whether or not the member of the IC is leaking information that might be classified. The journalist can legitimately seek information, and it's not their job to police it. The member of the US IC that leaks classified information has broken a law. Right. The, right. Le the clear legal obligation rests on those people who are in, in the government in possession of, of intelligence, uh, classified information. It's not the journalist's burden. Okay. It, the, our focus is and should be on the leakers, not those that are obtaining it as part of legitimate news gathering. So I want to hear this part one more time, and I know that the chairman has indulged me. I'm, I'm at and past time. But the American journalist who's seeking this information differs from Assange and WikiLeaks how? In that... There's at least a portion, and people can argue that maybe this conduct WikiLeaks has engaged in in the past that's closer to regular news gathering, but in my view, a huge portion of WikiLeaks' activities has nothing to do with legitimate news gathering, informing the public, commenting on important uh, public controversies, but it's simply about releasing classified information to damage the United States of America. And, and, and people sometimes get cynical about journalists. American journalists do not do that. They will almost always call us before they publish classified information and say, is there anything about this that's going to put lives in danger, that's going to jeopardize government people, military people, or, or innocent civilians anywhere in the world, and then work with us to try and accomplish their important First Amendment goals while safeguarding those interests? This activity I'm talking about, WikiLeaks, involves no such considerations whatsoever. It's what I said to intelligence porn. Just push it out in order to damage. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Franken. Uh, thank you, Senator Feinstein. Uh, good to see you, uh, Mr. Director. Um, I'm going to kind of pick, pick up where I think Sheldon uh, Whitehouse, Senator Whitehouse, was going. Uh, are you familiar with a report called the Kremlin Playbook? No. Okay. Um, this is a, an expert report that exhaustively documents Russia's past efforts to undermine European democracies. According to the report, Russia is known to cultivate close ties with business and political leaders in target countries. This is stuff you acknowledged yeah. to Senator Whitehouse that you knew happened. The report explains that, quote, Russia has cultivated an opaque network of patronage across the region that it uses to influence and direct uh, decision making. In other words, Russia has a strategy of creating the conditions that give rise to corruption then exploiting that corruption to its own benefit. In the intelligent com uh, intelligence community's unclassified assessment of the Russia, Russian campaign to influence the American election, our nation's intelligence agencies write, quote, Putin has had many positive experiences working with Western political leaders whose business interests made them more disposed to deal with Russia. That seems to jibe with your understanding of what Russia has done. Correct. Now, in that same assessment, the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA all concluded that Russia did, in fact, interfere in the 2016 election in order to, quote, help 
President-elect Trump's election chances, when possible, by discrediting Secretary Clinton. And the agencies concluded that the Russians had a clear preference for President Trump. What is your assessment of why the Russian government had a clear preference for President Trump? The intelligence community's assessment had a couple of parts with respect to that. One is he wasn't Hillary Clinton, who uh, Putin hated and wanted to harm in any possible way. And so he was her opponent, so necessarily they supported him. And then also this second notion that uh, the intelligence community assessed that Putin believed he would be more able to make deals, reach agreements with someone with a business background than with someone who had grown up in more of a government environment. Okay, well, um, I'm curious about just how closely Russia followed the Kremlin playbook when it meddled in our democracy, specifically whether the Russians had a preference for President Trump because he had already been ensnared in their web of patronage. Web of patronage is a quote from the report. Is it possible that in the Russians' views, view, Trump's business interests would make him more amenable to cooperating with them, quote, more disposed to deal with Russia, as the IC report says. That was not the basis for the IC's assessment. Okay, well, um, it, is it, I just said, is it possible? I see. You don't want to speculate. Yeah, because okay. possible questions are hard for me to answer. Yeah. Well, in order for us to know for certain whether President Trump would be vulnerable to that type of exploitation, we would have to understand his financial situation. We'd have to know whether or not he has money tied up in Russia or obligations to Russian entities. Do you agree? That you would need to understand that to evaluate that question? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Well, it seems to me that there's reason to believe that such connections exist. For example, the president's son, Donald Trump Jr., told real estate developers in 2008 that, quote, Russians make up a pretty disproportionate cross-section of a lot of our assets. He said, quote, we see a lot of money pouring in from Russia. This is a report on his fam the family business. In 2013, President Trump held the Miss Universe pageant in Moscow, and the pageant was financed by a Russian billionaire who was close to Putin. And President Trump sold a Palm Beach mansion to, Ru to a Russian oligarch for $95 million in 2008. That's $54 million more than he paid for it just four years prior. Those are three financial ties that we know of, and they're big ones. Director Comey, the Russians have a history of using financial investments to gain leverage over influential people and then later calling in favors. We know that. We know that the Russians interfered in our election, and they did it to benefit President Trump. The intelligence agencies confirmed that. But what I want to know is why they favored President Trump. And it seems to me that in order to answer that question, any investigation into whether the Trump campaign or Trump operation colluded with Russian operatives would require a full appreciation of the president's financial dealings. Director Comey, would President Trump's tax returns be material to such an investigation? That's not something, Senator, I'm going to answer. Uh, does, the invest, uh, does the investigation have access to President Trump's tax returns? I have to give you the same answer. Again, I, I hope people don't overinterpret my answers, but I just don't want to start talking about anything, what we're looking at and how. Uh, Director Comey, we continue to learn about ties between Russia and former members of the president's campaign and current senior members of his administration. Jeff Sessions, Attorney General and former campaign advisor Carter Page, former campaign advisor Paul Manafort, uh, I'm a former campaign manager Paul Manafort, uh, and also he was Chief Strategist Rex Tillerson, Secretary of State Ryder Stone, political mentor and former campaign advisor Michael Flynn, former National Security Advisor Jared Kushner, White House Senior Advisor and son-in-law. Now, we don't even know if this list 
is exhaustive, but I think you might see where I'm going. And these connections appear against a backdrop of proven Russian interference in the election, interference that the intelligence community has concluded was designed to favor President Trump. From, I'll, I know I'm hitting my time, but I'll, let me ask one, one question. For, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. From an investigative standpoint, is the sheer number of connections unusual or significant? What about each individual's proximity to the president? Is it unusual for individuals in these important roles to have so many unexpected and often undisclosed ties to a foreign power? I have to give you the same answer. That's not something I can comment on. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Director Comey. Um, with regard to 702 um, reauthorization, um, last, uh, well, the, the, uh, in 2014, the Privacy and Li Civil Liberties Oversight Board recommended that agencies develop mechanisms uh, to limit the potential scope of incidental collection. Um, under your leadership, what has the Bureau done to uh, uh, comply with these recommendations? What we've done is make sure that we have tightened up our training and our um, and making sure that nobody with unauthorized access gets to see the content of a 702 collection. That's probably a, a, a ugly way of summarizing it. There's a lot more beneath that, but that's the gist of it. Mm -hmm. Just to make sure we're still we're collected under under 702. Just to make sure that nobody gets access to it, doesn't have a need to know, and hasn't been trained on how to handle FISA information. Okay. Can you briefly describe the process for incidental collection or minimizing uh, those who are involved? Yeah, incidental collection is the name given to. Um, if you're targeting a terrorist, let's say, who's in Yemen, and he happens to be using an American email provider to communicate. So under 702, the U.S. intelligence community can collect that terrorist communications. He's outside the United States, and he's not an American. If an American contacts that terrorist, sends him an email at his, let's imagine it's a Gmail account, his Gmail, that will be incidentally collected. That American who sent the email to the terrorist is not the target, but because he or she communicated with the terrorist, that is collected as part of that lawful collection. That's what incidental collection means. And if the FBI is doing that 702 collection, those communications from the terrorist and to the terrorist would sit in our database. If we open an investigation on that person who happened to be the communicant and we search our systems, we will hit on that 702 collection and the investigating agent will know, holy cow, there's an American who was in touch with that terrorist in Yemen if that agent has been trained and has access to the information, they'll be able to know it. That's how our systems are designed. Well, thank you. I should say the same review that uh, was conducted in 2014 does point out the value of the program, I certainly think, and I think most of us do here see the incredible value of 702 and the need for reauthorization there. With regard to uh, just different topic completely, uh, Polygraph testing, as you're aware, any applicant for a law enforcement position with the federal government is required to undergo a polygraph. Um, it's worth noting that CPB experiences uh, significantly high, higher failure rates, around 65% than, and than any other uh, federal law enforcement agency. Uh, the FBI does pretty well uh, with this. Has the Bureau ever conducted any benchmarking with other federal agencies as to the process? Uh, where you require a polygraph for, for employment. Um, it, it seems that, uh, I mean, given FBI's success uh, with this instrument, that uh, you could inform some of the other agencies who are having difficulties. I don't know whether we have, Senator, but I'll find out. Right. I, I think we have with other members of the intelligence community, but I don't know whether we've talked to CBP about our program. All right. It would be helpful with regard to CPB if you could look into that. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, with regard to data breaches, following on what uh, Senator Sass was asking, um, given the amount of sensitive data held by the FBI, uh, what are you doing to protect um, your own systems? Well, a whole lot that I don't want to talk about too much in an open Understood. forum, but it is a constant worry of all of us. 
uh, under, since I've been director, we've stood up something called the Insider Threat Center, and I've put a senior executive, FBI executive, in charge of it because I want someone waking up every morning worrying about how might we lose data, who might be penetrating us, either our systems or as a human uh, asset. And so a ton of work has gone into protecting our systems. But the weakest link is always the people because you can have the greatest firewalls and the greatest intrusion detection system, but if your people are engaging in either negligent or intentional misconduct, all of that's defeated. So we're spending a lot of time trying to make sure we have a rich picture of our people that is constant and doesn't depend upon five-year polygraph reinvestigations, but that shows us flags of a troubled employee in real time. That's hard to do and build technically and as a matter of law and policy, but we're working very hard on it. In your opinion, is Congress doing enough to protect itself and our systems from outside, uh, uh, outside threats? I don't mean this as a wise guy answer. Surely not, because none of us can be doing enough, frankly. Again, it's not just about the, the perimeter we build. It's about the security culture uh, inside our organizations. And, and look, I'm part of the FBI, and I still don't think ours is good enough. I'm sure Congress is not good enough. Okay. As you know, the Freedom of Information Act allows uh, access. Citizens have the right to get information from the federal government. Can you uh, talk about how the Bureau uh, promptly and fully responds to FOIA requests uh, at the same time you level or uh, maintain some level of security over sensitive and classified data? We have an enormous FOIA operation, as you might imagine, that's working, I think, 24 hours a day. Uh, outside of Washington, D.C., great people who this is their life. They know the regulations, they know the security sensitivities, and work as hard as we can to comply with the FOIA deadlines. Um, it is it's a huge pain, but it's an essential part of being a public institution. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Grassley. Um, thank you, Director Comey, uh, for your service and for your uh, return in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, I want to start by uh, asking uh, about a letter, and Mr. Chairman, I'll submit this for the record if I might. Um, Senator Whitehouse and I, in uh, early of August last year, sent a letter to our colleague, Senator Cruz, uh, who then served as the Oversight uh, Subcommittee Chairman, um, expressing our grave concern about the potential for foreign interference in our upcoming presidential election. We asked for an oversight hearing to consider whether existing federal criminal statutes and court jurisdiction were sufficient to address conduct related to foreign entities posing a threat to our election. We didn't have that hearing, but I'd like to ask you that same question now. Are existing federal criminal statutes sufficient to prosecute conduct related to foreign entities that seek to undermine our elections? I think so, is my answer, but someone smarter than I may have spotted something where there's a gap, but my reaction is, we have the statutory tools. It's a question of gathering the evidence and then applying it under those statutory tools. Well, in response to questions from Senator Sass and Senator Graham earlier, uh, you stated uh, that you fully expect Russia to continue uh, to be engaged in efforts to influence our elections, and you expect them to be back in 2018 and in 2020. Um, what more should we be doing both to defend our election infrastructure and our future elections against continuing Russian interference? And what more are you doing, or is the agency doing, uh, to help our allies in countries like France and Germany that have upcoming elections uh, where there's every reason to believe the Russians are actively interfering there as well? Thank you, Senator. I think two things we can do and that we are doing, both in the United States and with our allies, is telling the people responsible for protecting the election infrastructure in the United States everything we know about how the Russians and, and others try to attack those systems, how they might come at it, what IP addresses they might use, what, what phishing techniques they might use. And then we've shared the same thing with our allies, one. Two, to equip the American people and our allies to understand that this is going on. Because a big part of what the Russians did was pushing out false information, echoing it with these troll farms that they use. And I think one of the most important things we can do is tell the American voter this is going on. You should be skeptical. You should ask questions. You should understand the nature of the news that you're getting. And we've done, we deliver that same message to our European colleagues. And an interesting thing is happening. The marketplace of ideas is responding to this because it's not a role for government. 
People are out there using the power of social media to push back against this kind of thing in France, in the Netherlands, in Germany, and I hope it'll happen here in the United States, where ordinary citizens will see this bogus stuff going on and push back, kind of have good troll armies pushing back the other way, so the marketplace of information is better educated, frankly. Well, it's an optimistic vision, and I appreciate it. I also appreciate the work the FBI continues. Uh, and to strengthen our defenses, but I think there's more to do. Um, you certainly, as you've testified before, made a great deal of news just before our own election. Um, and I'm struck that you chose to make public statements about one investigation and not another. The investigation we now know that was ongoing into the Trump campaign uh, and the investigation uh, ongoing into Secretary Clinton. I'm concerned about what the future practice will be. Um, how has the approach taken with regard to the Clinton investigation been memorialized, and have you modified in any way uh, FBI or department procedures regarding disclosure of information concerning investigations, particularly close to an election? Uh, we have not, and the reason for that is everything that we did, that I did, was, in my view, consistent with existing Department of Justice policy. That is, we don't confirm the existence of investigations except in unusual circumstances. We don't talk about closed, we don't talk about investigations that don't result in criminal charges unless there is a compelling public interest. And so those principles should still govern. We also, whenever humanly possible, avoid any action that might have an impact on an election. I still believe that to be true, an incredibly important guiding principle. It's one that I labored under here. Frankly, as I said earlier, I didn't think I had a choice because I could only have two actions before me. I couldn't find a door labeled no action. So those principles still exist. They're incredibly important. The current investigation with respect to Russia, we've confirmed it. The Department of Justice authorized me to confirm that it exists. We're not going to say another word about it until we're done. Then I hope in league with the Department of Justice we'll figure out if it doesn't result in charges, what, if anything, will we say about it and we'll be guided by the same principles? Well, Director, I, I do think there was a third door available to you uh, in, in late last year, just before the election, and that was to confirm the existence of an ongoing investigation uh, about the Trump campaign, uh, which I think was of compelling interest uh, and was an unusual circumstance, an activity by a known adversary to interfere in our election. Had there been public notice that there was a renewed investigation into both campaigns, I think the impact would have been different. Would you agree? No. Uh, I, I thought a lot about this, and my judgment was a counterintelligence. We have to separate two things. I thought it was very important to call out what the Russians were trying to do with our election. And I offered in August myself to be a voice for that in a public piece calling it out. The Obama administration didn't take advantage of that in August. They did it in October. But I thought that was very important to call out. That's a separate question from, do you confirm the existence of a classified investigation that has just started to try and figure out, are there any connections between that Russian activity and U.S. persons that started in late July? And remember, the Hillary Clinton investigation, we didn't confirm it existed until three months after it started, and it started publicly. So I thought the consistent principle would be, we don't confirm the existence of Certainly, any investigation that involves a U.S. person, but a classified investigation in its early stages. We don't know what we have, what is there. And so I, my judgment was consistent with the principles I've always operated under. That was the right thing to do. Separately, I thought it was very important to call out and tell the American people the Russians are trying to mess with your elections. Well, I hope that in the future, uh, that attempt to draw attention to Russian interference or an election, which you've testified you expect to continue, will be effective. Let me ask one last question, if I might. Um, there's a lot of ways that the FBI helps state and local law enforcement. Uh, one I've been grateful for was the Violence Reduction Network, uh, through which the FBI provided much-needed assistance uh, to Wilmington Police Department. This is my hometown, where we've had a dramatic spike in violence. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing uh, how you imagine or how you intend that the FBI will continue to assist local law enforcement in combating uh, unprecedented spikes in violent crime in a few of our communities, such as Wilmington, where they've happened. Yeah, we're trying to thank you for that, Senator. The VRN, the Violence Reduction Network, was piloted in Wilmington and, and a small number of other places, and we believe it works. Where the FBI brings to a fight that's primarily a state and local fight, our technology, our intelligence expertise at figuring out how to connect dots and which of the bad guys we should focus on, and then our enforcement, our agents and their ability to make cases. And so we're trying to do what we've done in Wilmington, in cities around the country, those cities that are seeing spikes in violence, 
And, and the depressing fact is about half of America's biggest cities saw another rise in violence the first quarter of this year. And so we're trying to lean forward and do what we've done in Wilmington in those places as well. Well, we appreciate your efforts to support local law enforcement. Thank you, Director. Senator Kennedy. Good morning, Mr. Director. This afternoon now. Uh, assume for a second that I'm not a United States Senator and that I don't have a security clearance to look at classified information. If someone sends me classified information, and I know or should know it's classified information, and I read it, have I committed a crime? Potentially. Has the person who sent me the information committed a crime? Potentially, if they knew you didn't have a appropriate clearance and a need to know. Okay. Was there classified information on, on former Congressman Weiner's computer? Yes. Who sent it to him? Uh, his then spouse, uh, Huma Abedin, appears to have had a regular practice of forwarding emails to him for him, I think, to print out for her so she could then deliver them to the uh, Secretary of State. Did Congress, former Congressman Weiner read the classified material? I don't, I don't think so. I think his I don't think we've been able to interview him because he has pending uh, criminal problems of other sorts, but my understanding is that his role would be to print them out as a matter of convenience. If he did read them, would he have committed a crime? Potentially. Uh, would his spouse have committed a crime? Again, potentially. It would depend upon a number of things. Is there an investigation with respect to the two of them? Uh, there was. It is. Uh, we completed it. Why did you conclude neither of them committed a crime? Because with respect to uh, Ms. Abbott in particular, we, we didn't have any indication that she had a sense that what she was doing was in violation of the law. Couldn't prove any sort of criminal intent. <clears throat> Really, the central problem we had with the whole email investigation was proving that people knew, the secretary and others knew that they were doing so, that they were communicating about classified information in a way that they shouldn't be, and proving that they had some sense that they were doing something unlawful. That was our burden, and we weren't able to meet it. So she thought it was okay to send her husband the information? Well, I think, I don't want to get too much into what she thought. We could not prove that the people sending the information, either in that case or in the other case with the secretary, uh, were acting with any kind of uh, mens rea, with any kind of criminal intent. Okay. Assume for a second, again, I'm not a United States senator. I'm working for a, for a presidential campaign, and I'm contacted by an, a, a Russian agent. And he just wants to uh, talk about the campaign in general and strategy. Am I committing a crime? Harder to answer. And one I want to be, I probably don't want to answer in the, in the, even in a hypothetical given the work that we're doing. All right. Well, let me try it this way. Let's assume that I'm not a United States senator and I'm working for a presidential campaign. And I'm contacted by a Russian agent who says, I've got some hacked emails here and I want to visit with you about them. Am I committing a crime? Yeah, also, um, Senator, I think I should resist answering that hypothetical. Okay. Can you explain to me, not the law, but just in your personal opinion, when interrogation techniques become torture? You mean not the law? That's right. There, there is a statute that defines torture in the United States. Uh, and so that, as a lawyer and as a member of a law enforcement organization, that's where I would start, uh, that the definition of torture is laid out in American statutes. I'm not sure I understand what you mean beyond that. I, I'm, I'm just asking your personal opinion about what you think constitutes torture, where, oh. you would, where you personally would draw the line drawing on your substantial experience. I'd say in general, any conduct that involves the intentional infliction of physical pain or discomfort in order to obtain information is, in the colloquial sense, torture. Okay. May not be torture under the statute, which Congress chose to define uh, at, a, at a fairly high level, but 
as a human being and a, and a FBI director, I consider the infliction of physical pain and discomfort to be, by and large, colloquially torture. Any kind of physical pain or discomfort? Suppose you just serve someone bad food. Well, again, tricky for us because the FBI does, is very careful never to inflict, intentionally inflict physical pain or discomfort of, of any sort to try and question somebody. So I understand. I'd say, yeah, that's conduct you should stay way clear of. Mr. Director, it's also you? ineffective, frankly, but that's a whole other deal. Sure. Do you think it is possible from a, from a law enforcement perspective to, to uh, properly vet uh, a non-American, non-citizen, I should say, coming to uh, the United States from a conflict area such as Syria? It's difficult to do it perfectly, and I have concerns about the ability to vet people coming from areas where we have no relationship on the ground with the government there. Uh, and so I suppose it's possible to do it reasonably. There's a number of tools you could bring to bear, but uh, there are always risks associated with that. I mean, how do you do it? You can't call, you can't call the uh, Chamber of Commerce in Syria. How do you do it? Well, you, and we do it now, we query the holdings of the entire American intelligence community to see if any, what we call selectors, phone numbers, emails, addresses associated with that person have ever shown up anywhere in the world mm. in our holdings. That's a pretty good way to do it. Uh, getting into the person's social media to see what they have there yes, sir. is another pretty good way to do it. The way we rely on, uh, in most cases, is the host government will have information about them. Yes, and, I'm and even where the host government... looking up my article here. Go ahead. Yeah. And in Iraq, uh, we had a United States military presence for many years and collected a whole lot of biometrics. So we can query that to see if the person's fingerprints ever showed up. Uh, can I any, stop you for one yeah, moment? i got 10 seconds. Sure, I'm sorry. How about Yemen? Similarly difficult. I yield back my three seconds, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Arono. Thank you. Hmm? You've been getting a, a lot of uh, questions uh, surrounding your decision to, uh, to uh, make certain statements about the investigation into Secretary Clinton's emails. And um, uh, to many of us, you treated the investigation of the Clinton email investigation, or matter, whatever you want to call it, differently than how you treated the ongoing investigation of the Trump campaign and the Russian attempts to interfere with their elections. And while you've, uh, if I can understand correctly, that there's a, uh, you felt free to speak about the Clinton investigation because it had been completed when you had your press conference in July? Correct. Of 2016. Um, and you do confirm that, that there is still an ongoing investigation of the uh, Trump uh, campaign and their uh, uh, conduct with regard to, uh, to Russian efforts to uh, undermine our elections? We're conducting an investigation to understand whether there was any coordination between Ru the Russian efforts and anybody associated with the Trump campaign. So since you've already uh, confirmed that such an investigation is ongoing, can you tell us more about what constitutes that investigation? No. In July of 2016, when you announced that uh, you were not going to be br bringing criminal charges against Secretary Clinton because uh, you did need to show intent and there was no intent discovered, you, you, you spoke for 15 minutes. And not only did you say that you were not going to uh, bring criminal charges against her, by the way, which you said at the end of your 15 minutes, but you uh, went on to chastise her, saying that she had been extremely careless you raised questions about her judgment. You contradicted statements she had made about her email uh, practices and said that possibly that uh, hostile foreign agents or governments had gained access to her server and that had she still been employed by the government, she could have faced disciplinary action for what she did. I just wanted to uh, you know whether when you made all those Public, the public statements chastising her, which amounts to editorializing on your decision not to um, uh, bring about criminal charges. It had to occur to you that this public chastisement put uh, Secretary 
Clinton in a negative light. So did you consider whether this public chastisement might affect the, her campaign? I have to respectfully disagree with your characterization of my intention as chastising or editorializing. My goal was to say what is true. What did we do? What did we find? What do we think about it? And I tried to be as complete and fair as I could be and tell the truth about what we found and what we think about it and what we're recommending. So when you said that she was uh, behaving in an extremely, what was it, extremely careless, can you cite me to other examples where you made some, those kinds of um, comments that elaborated on an FBI's decision not to bring about criminal charges? I can't as director. I know the department has in the uh, IRS email investigation. They wrote a report after they were done chastising Lois Lerner, I think the woman's name was, for her behavior in a similar way. And so it happens. It's very unusual, but it happens. But uh, we know that you were very concerned about what might happen if it came to light that you had uh, possibly gone easy on Mrs. Clinton and uh, therefore um, that, that, that you were concerned about the political ramifications of your decisions and yet... Uh, I was not. So you did not consider that your statements about a person who was running for president would not have a negative effect on her? I tried very hard not to consider what effect it might have politically. I tried very hard to credibly complete an investigation that had gotten extraordinary public attention and my judgment, and people can disagree about this, was that offering as much transparency as possible about what we did, what we found, and what we think of it was the best way to credibly complete the investigation. I wasn't thinking about what effect it might have on a political campaign. I find that very hard to, uh, uh, to really, you know, I, I, I find that hard to believe that you did not uh, contemplate that there would be political ramifications to your comments. Oh, and I knew there I'm just be, wondering why you... I knew there you... would be ramifications. I just tried not to care about them. I knew there'd be a huge storm that would come, but I tried to say, what is the right thing to do in this case? Yes, you're right. The right thing would have been that you did not have enough evidence to bring about criminal charges, and that should have been the end of it, I would think. I don't understand why you chose to go forward with all kinds of uh, characterizations about her actions. I, that I find hard to believe, and uh, that uh, you would not have considered the political ramifications or that it did not. You may not have considered it, but the thought should have occurred to you, and that uh, I would think that you would have bent over backwards not to, uh, to say anything that would have an impact on the campaign or on the election because you seem to do that, that that was a concern for you. Let me turn to the Trump administration's vetting and security clearances and that process. In recent days, there have been numerous reports of Trump administration officials failing to disclose foreign contacts in their security clearance forms. What is the role of the FBI in vetting the security clearances of White House personnel, if any? Well, sometimes the FBI is assigned to do the background checks on people who are coming into government uh, in the executive office of the president. Other times not. A lot of times they're people who are arriving with clearances that already exist. So in the case of the Trump administration officials, and there have been a number of them, was the FBI asked to uh, participate in the vetting process? The FBI has done background checks for some appointees in the Trump administration. Can you disclose who these appointees were or are? I, I can't. I'm not comfortable sitting right here. I don't know them for sure, but I shouldn't talk about individuals in an open forum, at least without thinking about it better. What would be the consequences for a White House staffer or personnel who fails to disclose their foreign contacts on a security clearance form? Well, hard to say. It could include losing your clearances. If conduct is intentional, it could subject someone to criminal liability. And is that something that the Department of Justice would investigate and pursue? Potentially. Uh, it, I think it would depend upon who owned the clearance as well. In the first instance, it might be another part of the intelligence community. So since there have been these concerns raised about uh, the clearances uh, not being appropriately vetted, uh, is there an ongoing FBI investigation? into what happened with the vetting process and whether any crimes may have been committed? It's not something I can comment on sitting here. Senator Cruz. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Comey, welcome. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your testimony. Um, you know, I have to say I found your answer to, to Senator Kennedy a few minutes ago puzzling. 
in, in that you describe the reason why uh, the case was closed against Ms. Abedin as that you could not determine she was aware her conduct was unlawful. And the reason that answer is puzzling is, is you're a very accomplished lawyer, and, and as you're well aware, uh, every first-year law student learns in criminal law that ignorance of the law is no excuse, and that mens rea does not require knowledge that conduct is unlawful. And, and in fact, the governing statutes, 18 U.S.C. 793F and 18 U.S.C. 798F, uh, 798A, have no requirement of a knowledge of unlawful. 798A provides whoever knowingly and willfully communicates, furnishes, transmits, or otherwise makes available to an, unauth an unauthorized person classified information shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 10 years or both. Uh, under the terms of that statute, the fact pattern you described in this hearing seems to fit that statute directly in that, if I understand you correctly, you said Ms. Abedin forwarded hundreds or thousands of classified emails to her husband on a non-government, non-classified comp uh, computer. How is... How does that conduct not directly violate that statute? First, Senator, I, 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 if I said that I misspoke, she forwarded hundreds and thousands of emails, some of which contain classified information. Uh, in the, uh, for generations, generations I think is a fair way to say it, uh, the Department of Justice has understood that statute to require, in practice, and I believe they think in law, to require a general sense of criminal intent. That is, not a specific intent, but a general criminal intent. An, a sense, a knowledge that what you're doing is unlawful. Not violating a particular statute, but some general criminal mens rea. I can't find a case that's been brought in the last 50 years based on negligence, based on, without some showing or indicia of intent. Uh, you and I have both worked in a number of jobs that require dealing with classified information. Uh, and on its face, anyone dealing with classified information should know that that conduct is impermissible. Let me ask you, how would you handle an FBI agent who forwarded thousands of classified emails to his or her spouse on a non-government computer? Well, there'd be significant administrative discipline. I'm highly confident they wouldn't be prosecuted. I'm also highly confident there would be discipline. All right, let's, let's shift, shift to another topic. Um, in the previous Congress, I, I chaired a hearing on, on the willful blindness of the Obama administration to radical Islamic terrorism. We heard testimony from a whistleblower at the Department of Homeland Security that described a purge DHS had, had undergone of editing or deleting over 800 records at DHS to remove references to radical Islam to the Muslim Brotherhood. And, and the purge indeed was the word used by the White House that directed DHS to conduct that purge. Um, we obviously have a new administration now, a new White House, a new Attorney General. Uh, has the approach of the FBI to radical Islamic terrorism changed in any respect with the new administration? Not that I'm aware of, no. Uh, let me ask you about one specific terror attack, which is on May 15th, uh, on, on May, in May of 2015, the terrorist attack in Garland, Texas, where two terrorists opened fire on a peaceful gathering. And thankfully, no innocent people were killed thanks to the heroic action of Garland police officer Greg Stevens, uh, who fatally shot the two terrorists. Uh, but a security officer was shot in the leg, and it, and it could have been much, much worse. Uh, at the time of the incident, uh, you stated publicly that the, that the FBI did not know that the terrorists were on their way to the event and that, or that they planned on attacking the event. Recently, there have been media reports suggesting otherwise, specifically media reports that have stated that an undercover FBI agent was in close communication with the two terrorists in the weeks leading up to the attack, explicitly discussed plans for the attack, uh, and 
was in a car directly behind the two terrorists outside the event and took photos of the terrorists moments before the attack, but then left the scene when the shooting began and, and that that agent was detained by the Garland police. Uh, are, are those media reports correct? No. I stand by what I said originally. I can't go into the details of it here because they're classified, but the, I think a fair thing to say is the media reports are highly misleading. And in a classified setting, I could explain to you how. Okay. I, I, I would appreciate you or your designee sharing those in a classified setting I'll get so, you so that, that I, I can, can learn more of what, what occurred. This committee has had substantial focus also on the practice of the previous IRS of targeting citizens and citizen groups based on their political speech, political views, and perceived political opposition to President Obama. Uh, and the previous Department of Justice, both Attorneys General Holder and Lynch, in my view, stonewalled that investigation. Is the FBI currently investigating the FBI's, uh, rather the IRS's, unlawful targeting of citizens for exercising political speech? I think you're referring to the original, the investigation focusing on particularly uh, groups allegedly associated with Tea Party? Yes. Uh, we completed that investigation and the department declined prosecution. We worked very hard on it, put a lot of people on it, couldn't make what we thought was a, a case, and it, to my knowledge it has not been reopened. So did, did the FBI recommend prosecution? You said you couldn't make the no. case. No, we couldn't prove, again, the challenge of intent. We couldn't prove that anybody was targeting these folks because they were conservatives or associated with the Tea Party. We worked very hard to see if we could make that case. We couldn't get there. Thank you. Uh, Senator Blumenthal. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Director Comey, for being here. And... Uh, Thank you to you and the men and women who work with you at the FBI for their extraordinary service to our country. Much of it unappreciated, uh, as you remarked so powerfully in your opening statement. Uh, you have confirmed, I believe, that the FBI is investigating potential ties between Trump associates and the Russian interference in the 2016 campaign, correct? Yes. And you have not, to my knowledge, ruled out anyone in the Trump campaign as potentially a target of that criminal investigation, correct? Well, I haven't said anything publicly about who we've opened investigations on. I've briefed the chair and ranking on who those people are, and so I, I, can't, I can't go beyond that in this setting. Have you ruled out anyone in the campaign that you can disclose? I don't feel comfortable answering that, Senator, because I think it puts me on a slope to talking about who we're investigating. And have, I, you, have you ruled out the President of the United States? I don't, I, I don't want people to overinterpret this answer. I'm not going to comment on anyone in particular, because that puts me down a slope of because if I say no to that, then I have to answer uh, succeeding questions. So what we've done is brief the chair and ranking on who the U.S. persons are that we've opened investigations on, and that's, all, that's as far as we're going to go at this point. But as a former prosecutor, you know that when there's an investigation into several potentially culpable individuals, the evidence from those individuals and the investigation can lead to others, correct? Correct. We're always open-minded about, and we follow the evidence wherever it takes us. So potentially the President of the United States could be a target of your ongoing investigation into the Trump campaign's involvement with Russian interference in our election, correct? I just worry, I, I don't want to answer that because that, that seems to me unfair speculation. Uh, we will follow the evidence. We'll try and find as much as we can and we'll follow the evidence wherever it leads. Wouldn't this situation be ideal for the appointment of a special prosecutor, an independent counsel, in light of the fact that the Attorney General has recused himself and, so far as your answers indicate today, no one has been ruled out publicly 
in your ongoing investigation. I understand the reasons that you want to avoid ruling out anyone publicly, but for exactly that reason, because of the appearance of a potential conflict of interest, isn't this situation absolutely crying out for a special prosecutor? That's a judgment for the, the Deputy Attorney General, the Acting Attorney General on this matter, and, and not something I should comment on. You had some experience in this kind of decision. In 2003, you admirably appointed a special prosecutor, Patrick Fitzgerald, when the Attorney General, then uh, John Ashcroft, refused, recused himself from involvement in the investigation concerning whether the Bush administration officials illegally disclosed the identity of an undercover CIA official. Are there any differences materially between that situation and this one so far as the reasons to appoint a special counsel? Well, I think both situations, as with all uh, investigations that touch on people who've been actors in a political world involve considerations of actual conflict of interest and appearance of conflict of interest. And I'm not going to talk about the current situation. In that situation, my judgment was that the credibility of the investigation into the leak of the CIA officer's identity would be best served by not having it overseen by myself because I was a political appointee and appointing someone and giving him the authority to run it separate from the political leadership of the Department of Justice. That was my judgment in that circumstance. I don't know what judgment the acting attorney general will make. I'm sure he'll consider many of the same things. Uh, Has he value. asked for your advice? I'm not, I'm not going to say, Senator, because I wouldn't. When I was DAG, I didn't want people talking about what their conversations with me, so I'll, I'll, I'll do the same for him. So far as the investigation, the ongoing investigation into Trump associates and their potential collusion with the Russian meddling in our election, will you be providing any updates to the American people? Certainly not before the matter is concluded. And then, depending upon how the matter is concluded, I mean, some matters are concluded with criminal charges, and then there's a public accounting and a charging document. Other matters, as was the case with the email investigation, end with no charges, but some statement of some sort. Others end with no statement. I don't know yet. And obviously, I'd want to do that in close coordination with the department. Will you make recommendations to, presumably it would be the deputy attorney general or the special prosecutor, if one is appointed, as to whether criminal charges should be brought? I don't know in this case in particular, but in general, we almost always do, especially the highest profile matters. But you cannot yourself pursue criminal charges, correct? Correct. I think that's important for the American people to understand because it bears on the question of whether a special prosecutor ought to be appointed. The FBI may inspire great credibility and trust, but the FBI cannot bring charges. Neither can the intelligence committees do so, nor can an independent commission. Only the deputy attorney general or a special prosecutor designated by him, correct? Correct. Let me uh, close because I am running out of time. Uh, have you uh, been questioned at all by the Inspector General in connection with the inquiry that I understand is ongoing into a number of the topics that we've been discussing here? Yes, I've been interviewed. The Inspector General is inspecting me and looking at my conduct in the course of the email investigation, which I know this sounds like a crazy thing to say. I encourage, I want that inspection because I, I want my story told because some of it's classified, but also if I did something wrong, I want to hear that. I don't think I did, but yeah, I've been interviewed and I'm sure I'll be interviewed again. Do you have any regrets or are there any things you would do differently in connection with either the comments you made at the time you close the investigation or when you then indicated to Congress that you were, in effect, reopening it? Yeah. The honest answer is no. I've asked myself that a million times because, Lordy, has this been painful? 
Um, the only thing I regret is that maybe answering the phone when they called to recruit me to be FBI director when I was living happily in Connecticut. Um, <laughs> And, we would uh, welcome you back to Canada. Yeah, anyway. but on, I really, I can't. And I, I've gotten all kinds of rocks thrown at me, and this has been really hard. But I think I've done the right thing at each turn. I'm not on anybody's side. So hard for people to see that. But I, look, I've asked that a million times. Should you have done this? Should you have done that? And I, actually, the honest answer, I don't mean to say arrogant, is I wouldn't have done it any differently. Somehow I'd have prayed it away, wished it away, wished that I was on the shores of the uh, Connecticut Sound. But... Failing that, I, I don't have any regrets. Uh, I want to ask one last question unrelated to this topic uh, on the issue of gun violence. Would you agree that universal background checks would help with law enforcement and prevention of gun violence? The more able we are to keep guns out of the hands of criminals and spouse abusers and all the, the better. So the more information we have, the better for law enforcement perspective. I'll take that as a yes. Thank you. I call on Senator Tillis. Uh, I think we have one member that, if if that member is going to come back for first round, then we have three or four, maybe five of us that want a second round. Uh, so I hope that people will get back here so we know exactly how many people we have. Out of courtesy to the Senator Co or Director Comey, Senator Tillis. Director Comey, thank you for being here. I'm I'm always impressed with your composure and your uh, preparation. And uh, I want to get to a couple of other things, uh, maybe first, then if I have time, come back to uh, what the hearing has been predominantly about. Uh, when you briefed us last year, I think that you said that there were some, that there were ongoing investigations on homeland, uh, homeland security, potential terrorists, either homegrown or uh, foreign-inspired investigations in every state. Is that still the case? Yes. Do you have roughly, an, can you give me roughly an idea of the number of investigations that is? Yeah, it's just north of 1,000. Just north of 1,000. Yeah, we have, that, that caseload has stayed about the same since we last talked about it. Some have closed, some have opened, but about 1,000 homegrown violent extremist investigations in the United States. And do, at the time, I also asked a question about uh, to what extent that you can discuss in this uh, setting um, were people who are the target of those investigations, persons who came in through uh, various programs where questions about vetting have been raised as whether or not they're accurate. At the time, there were, there were a dozen and a half, I think, that you may have estimated. Do you have any rough numbers about that? Yeah, I do. If you, we have about 1,000 homegrown violent extremist investigations, and we probably have another 1,000 or so that are... I should define my terms. Homegrown violent extremists, we mean somebody, we have no indication that they're in touch any with any terrorists. Touch, yeah. right. Then we have another big group of people that we're looking at who we see some contact with foreign terrorists. So you take that 2,000 plus cases, about 300 of them are people who came to the United States as refugees. Okay. Um, and to what extent in all of those investigations, you mentioned earlier that there are probably about half of the uh, various computing devices that you've accessed that you can't get into with any technology that the FBI has, which I assume is some of the most advanced available. Um, to what extent is the access to that information uh, relevant in these investigations of potential homeland threats? Oh, it's a, it's a feature of all our work, but especially concerning here, because we're trying through, through lawful process figure out are they consuming this poison on the internet and are they in touch with anybody? And so it's true in terrorism cases, about half the devices we can't open. About 90-some percent of our subjects are using at least one encrypted app as well that Mr. we can't read. So, Mr. Director, just because of physical and technological constraints, half of the base of information you'd like to harvest you can't get to. Uh, without 702, how much more of the remaining half would be, uh, would be harmed? Uh, well, the, the 702 actually addresses a different challenge. Yep. Losing 702 would be disastrous because it would lose our it, window. It is relevant in these investigations. However. It is. Yeah. Because that's what I mean. So half of the physical assets you can't already get access to. Then there's the metadata and all the other information that would be instructive to these investigations. So when, by, by going dark, do we mean 100 percent? 
But we're headed towards 100%. If we, 702 is our window into the really bad guys overseas. And if we close that window, I don't know why on earth we would close that so window. So we have thousands of investigations of potential homeland security threats evenly split by either people who have self-radicalized or some who have been influenced, some who have come over in refugee programs, uh, that we will basically pull the rug out from under you in terms of being able to, to actively investigate them, or I should say expeditiously investigate them. We'll certainly significantly impair our ability to investigate them. And that's what fo folks often say, why don't you get metadata? You can't convict somebody and incapacitate them based on metadata. You've got to drill down. The director, call me in my remaining time. I want to go back to the... Uh, to the investigation. And I, I just want to give you another opportunity to maybe finish by explaining the context that you were operating in. But I want to, I want to create the context going back to when the investigation first began. It was already a part of media attention. I think on June the 27th, uh, the then Attorney General met with the spouse of someone who's subject to an active investigation, which was at, at the very least an unusual encounter, which also spun up the media. And then I think it was July 5th that you made the statement that uh, uh, I think a, a few of the things you've said that uh, I guess based on the evidence you were gathering, there was one component. It was like removing a frame from a huge finished jigsaw puzzle and dumping pieces on the floor, something else that the media ties into. Then you said there is evidence of potential violations of statutes regarding the handling of classified information. Um, and you went on to say that under circum uh, similar circumstances, a person... Uh, who's engaged in these activities would likely be subject to security or administrative sanctions. I mean, that was the tough part of the statement that you made. But you went on uh, to, to say that you didn't believe a reasonable-minded prosecutor would bring a case, even though there was evidence of potential violations, and that you were expressing your view that the Justice Department should not proceed. Is that, is that typical for you to go to a point and say, I've gathered this information. There may be evidence of uh, violations, but we don't think any reasonable prosecutor in the DOJ would pursue it. Therefore, we're going to recommend not pursuing it. Is that common? For an FBI director to do that? Yeah. I, I've never heard of it. I never imagined but, it ever until this circumstance. When I Was there some logic in that at the time that you were making that decision based on the information that you were provided? Was there the same sort of thought process that you're going through there to have it rise to that level that then led to your October 28th notification of Congress that you had to look at other evidence that, that had been identified uh, on uh, Anthony Weiner's PC? Um, uh, what I'm trying to do is say it, it looks like you were trying to provide as much transparency and as much real-time information as you had. Yeah. Uh, and then on, on November the 6th, the FBI apparently moved heaven and earth and got something done in a matter of days that they thought was going to take beyond the election. But you were in that pressure cooker. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to glue together, I think, the decision for your actions uh, on July the 5th and, and how I think there's parallels between that and what you ultimately did on... Uh, October the 28th and then November the 6th, and I'll yep. yield back the remaining of my time for the answer. And I, I, I've lived my whole life caring about the credibility and the integrity of the criminal justice process, that the American people believe it to be and that it be, in fact, fair, independent, and honest. And so what I struggled with in the spring of last year was how do we credibly complete the investigation of Hillary Clinton's emails if we conclude there's no case there. The normal way to do it would be to have the Department of Justice announce it. And I struggled as we got closer to the end of it with the, a number of things that had gone on, some of which I can't talk about yet, that made me worry that the department leadership could not credibly complete the investigation and decline prosecution without grievous damage to the American people's confidence in the, in the justice system. And then the capper was, and I'm not picking on the, the Attorney General, Loretta Lynch, who I like very much, but her meeting with President Clinton on that airplane was the capper for me. And I then said, you know what? The department cannot by itself credibly end this. The best chance we have as a justice system is if I do something I never imagined before, step away from them and tell the American people, look, here's what the FBI did, here's what we found, here's what we think. And that that offered us the best chance of the American people believing in the system that it was done in a credible way. That was a hard call for me to make, to call the Attorney General that morning and say, I'm about to do a press conference and I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to say. And I said to her, I hope someday you'll understand why I think I have to do this. 
But look, I wasn't loving this. I knew this would be disastrous for me personally, but I thought this is the best way to protect these institutions that we care so much about. And having done that, and then having testified repeatedly under oath, we're done, this was done in a credible way, there's no there there, that when the Anthony Weiner thing landed on me on October 27th, and there was a huge, this is what people forget, new step to be taken, we may be finding the gold and missing emails that would change this case. If I were not to speak about that, it would be a disastrous, catastrophic concealment. It was an incredibly painful choice, but actually not all that hard, between very bad and catastrophic. I had to tell Congress that we were taking these additional steps. I prayed to find a third door. I couldn't find it. Two actions, speak or conceal. I don't think many reasonable people would do it differently than I did, no matter what they say today. If you were standing there staring at that on October 28th, would you really conceal that? So I spoke. Again, the design was to act credibly, independently, and honestly so the American people know the system's not rigged in any way. And that's why I felt transparency was the best path in July. And then I wasn't seeking transparency in October. I sent that letter only to the chairs and rankings. Yeah, did I know they were going to leak it? Of course. I know how Congress works. But I did not make an announcement at that point. And then your, my amazing people moved heaven and earth to do what was impossible, to get through those emails by working 24 hours a day, and then said, honestly, sir, we found tons of new stuff. Doesn't change our view. And I said, are you sure? Don't do it just because you're under pressure. They said, we're sure. We don't believe there's a case against Hillary Clinton. And I said, then, by God, i got to tell Congress that, and no, I'm going to get a storm at me for that. But what I can promise you all along is, I said to people, you may think we're idiots. We're honest people. We made judgments trying to do the right thing, and I believe, even with hindsight, we made the right decisions. And I'm sorry for that long answer. Uh, Director Comey, I, we have uh, seven times six is 42 minutes. Uh, I, I hope you won't want to take a break. I'm made of stone. Thank you. Uh, on, on March the 6th, I wrote to you asking about the FBI's relationship with the author of the tr Trump Russia dossier, Christopher Steele. Most of these questions have not been answered, so I'm going to ask them now. Prior to the Bureau launching the investigation of the alleged ties between the Trump campaign and Russia, did anyone from the FBI have interactions with Mr. Steele regarding the issue? It's not a question that I can answer in this forum. As you know, I've, I've briefed you privately on this, and if there's more that's necessary, then I'd be happy to do it privately. Have have you ever represented to a judge that the FBI had interaction with Mr. Steele, whether by name or not, regarding alleged ties between the Trump campaign and Russia prior to the Bureau launching its investigation of the matter? I have to give you the same answer, Mr. Chairman. This one I'm going to expect an answer on. Do FBI policies, just the policies, allow it to pay an outside investigator for work another source is also pay, paying him for as well? Want me to repeat it? Do FBI policies allow it to pay an outside investigator for work that another source is also paying that uh, investigator for? I don't know for sure as I sit here. I, possibly is my answer, but I'll get you a precise answer. In writing? Sure. Okay. Uh, did the FBI provide any payments whatsoever to Mr. Steele related to the investigation of Trump associates? I'm back to my first, I can't answer in this forum. Was the FBI aware, was the FBI aware that Mr. Steele reportedly paid his sources, who in turn paid their subsources to make the claim in the dossier? Same answer, sir. Here's one you ought to be able to answer. Is it vital to know, is it vital to know whether or not sources have been paid in order to evaluate their credibility? And if they have been paid, doesn't that information need to be disclosed if you're relying on that information in seeking approval for investigative authority? I think in general, yes. I think it is vital to know. The FBI? and the Justice Department have provi provided me material inconsistent answers in closed settings about its reported relationship 
with Mr. Steele, will you commit to fully answering the questions from my March 6th and April 28th letter and providing all requested documents so that we can resolve those inconsistencies even if in a closed session being necessary? Because as I sit here, I don't know all the questions that are in the letters. I, I don't want to answer that specifically, but I commit to you to giving you all the information you need to address just that challenge, because I don't believe there's any inconsistency. I think there's a misunderstanding, but in a classified setting, I'll, I'll give you what you need. Okay. Well, I hope to show you those inconsistencies. No, and I think I know what you're, you're, uh, where the confusion is, but I think in a okay. classified setting, we can straighten it out. Question, uh, next question. According to a complaint filed with the Justice Department, the company that oversaw dossier's creation was also working with a former Russian intelligence operate, operative on a pro-Russian lobbying project. At the same time, the company Fusion GPS allegedly failed to register as a foreign agent for its work to undermine the Magnitsky Act which is a law that lets the president punish Russian officials who violate human rights. Before I sent you a letter about this, were you aware of the complaint against Fusion was acting as an unregistered agent for Russian interest? It's not a question I can answer in this forum. You can't answer that? No. No, I can't. Uh, Go on to something else. Last week, the FBI filed a declaration in court pursuant to Freedom of Information Act litigations. The FBI said that a grand jury issued subpoenas for Secretary Clinton's emails, yet you refused to tell this committee whether the FBI saw it or had been denied access to grand jury process from the Justice Department. So. I think a very simple question. Why does the FBI give more information to someone who files a lawsuit than to an oversight committee in the Congress? And that has happened to me several times. I'm not sure, Senator, whether that's what happened here. Uh, but you're right. I refuse to confirm in our hearings as to whether we'd used a grand jury and how. I think that's the right position. Because I don't know it well enough, I don't think I can tell you I don't think I can distinguish the statements made in the FOIA case as I sit here. But, yeah. Well, just as a matter of proposition, then, if, if I, Chuck Grassley, as a private citizen, file a Freedom of Information Act, and you give me more information than you'll give to Senator Chuck Grassley, how do you justify that? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't, what I do you can't... mean it's a good question? How do you justify it? What, oh, I was going to say, it's a good question. I can't as I sit here. Ye gods. Was the Clinton investigation named Operation Mid-Year because it needed to be finished before the Democratic National Convention? If so, why the artificial deadline? If not, why was that the name? No, certainly not, because it had to be finished by a particular date. Um, there's an art and a science to how we come up with code names for cases. They, they assure me it's done randomly. Sometimes I see ones that make me smile, so I'm not sure. But I can assure you that, that it was called Mid-Year Exam was the name of the case. I can assure you the name was not selected for any nefarious purpose or because of any timing on the investigation. Last question. When was the grand jury convened? Was it before you f your first public statement about closing the case? I'm still not in a position where I'm comfortable confirming uh, whether and how we used a grand jury. In an, in an open setting. I don't know enough about what was said in the FOIA case to know whether that makes my answer silly, but I just want to be so careful about talking about grand jury matters. So I'm, I'm not going to answer that, sir. Senator Feinstein. Thanks very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Director, first of all, thank you for your fortitude going through this. Appreciate it. In your testimony, you noted that the first half of the fiscal year, the FBI was unable to access the content of more than 3,000 mobile devices, even though the FBI had the legal authority to do so. Um, I'm familiar with one of those, and that is the uh, Southern California uh, terrorist attack, which uh, where, where 14 people were killed in San Bernardino. 
of those 3,000 devices that you weren't able to access, can you say how many of these were related to a counterterrorism uh, event? I don't know as I sit here, Senator, but we can get you that information. Yeah, I really uh, very much appreciate that. Um, we had looked at uh, legislation that would take into consideration uh, events of national security and provide that um, devices, it, it must be some way of even going before a judge and getting a court order to be able to open a device. Do you think that would work? Well, that would sure, to my mind, be a, a better place for us to be from a public safety perspective, but we aren't there now. Um, in terms, this week, uh, the British Parliament's Home Affairs Secret Select Committee released a report finding that social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube failed to remove extremist material posted by banned jihadist and neo-Nazi groups, even when that material was reported. The committee urged tech companies to pay for and publicize online content monitoring activities and called on the British government to strengthen laws related to the publication of such material. Last year, I worked with Senators Burr, Rubio, and Nelson to introduce a bill to require tech companies to report terrorist activity on their platforms to law enforcement. What do you advise? Um, the provision, we modeled it after an existing law, which requires tech companies to notify authorities about cases of child pornography, but does not require companies to monitor any user, subscriber, or customer. Um, I plan to reintroduce the provision in separate legislation. So here are two questions. Would the FBI benefit from knowing when technology companies see terrorist plotting and other illegal activity online? Yes. Would the FBI be willing to work with the Judiciary Committee going forward on this provision? Yes, Senator. I don't know it well enough to offer you a view, but we'd be happy to work with you on it. Well, I, I was so struck when uh, San Bernardino happened and um, you made overtures to allow that device to be opened and then the FBI had to spend $900,000 to hack it open. And as I subsequently learned of some of the reason for it, there were good reasons to get into that device. And the concern I have is that once people have been killed in a terrorist attack, and there may be other DNA, there may be other messages that lead an investigative agency to believe that there are others out there, isn't it to the for the protection of the public that one would want to be able to see if a device could be opened. And I've had a very hard time. I've, tried, I've gone out, I've tried to talk to the tech companies, they're in my state. Um, one, Facebook um, was very good and understood the problem, but most do not. Has the FBI ever talked with the tech companies about this need in particular? Yes, Senator. We've had a lot of conversations, and as I said earlier, they're, in my sense, they've been getting more productive because I think the tech companies have come to see the darkness a little bit more. My, my concern was privacy is really important, but I might, that they didn't see the public safety costs. I think they're starting to see that better. And what, what nobody wants to have happen is something terrible happen in the United States and it be connected to the, our inability to access information with lawful authority. That we ought to have the conversations before that happens. And the companies more and more get that, uh, I, I think, over the last year and a half. 
And, but it's vital. We weren't picking on Apple in the San Bernardino case. Right. There were real reasons why we need to get into that device. And, and that is true in case after case after case, which is why we have to figure out a way to optimize those two things, privacy and public safety. Well, to be candid, my understanding about some of this was that the European community had special concerns about privacy and that some of the companies in our country were concerned, well, they would lose business. That European concern is changing. I think what I read about the UK, what I understand is happening in France and Germany, increased sharing of intelligence. The realization, I think, that they have um, very dangerous people in large numbers, um, possibly plotting at any given time to uh, uh, carry out an attack, has had some palliative effect. And there may be a change of viewpoint. So it would be very helpful if our law enforcement community could help us. And this is not to monitor. This is very basic. If there is a piece of evidence that says, hey, there may be a cell, there may be another individual out there, you have a chance of getting into that piece of evidence to see if that's true. Right, with a judge's permission. With a judge's permission. That's correct. So I thank you for that. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, we, we, Senator Lee hasn't had first round, so I got to go to Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Comey, for being here today, and thanks for your service to our country. Um, I want to talk to you about something raised by one of my colleagues a little while ago about electronic communications transaction records. Would it be fair to s say that electronic communications transaction records include such things as uh, browsing history, uh, one's history of websites that uh, one might have visited on the Internet? Yes. Would it be fair to say also that what one views, what pages one has visited, m might in some ways be indicative of what one is reading. Potentially, you're right. E even if you don't have see where they went on the page, that they went to ESPN or some or fishing magazine, gives you some indication of their interest. Yes. Individually and collectively, you can f find out a fair amount about a person, especially if you're able to review what it is that they've been reading for a certain period of time. Right. We I, the only reason I'm hesitating is, as I understand it, we can't look at, all we can get is the websites visited, not where they went on the page or what they clicked on. But it does give some indication of your interest, just like who you call gives you some indication of your interests. But where they went on the website will also be indicative of uh, what they did on the website, would it not? I mean, if you can get that granular information about what subpart, not just that they went to ESPN, but they went to ESPN and read this or that article. Right. My understanding is that we can't with an NSL, as we understand the statute, get that subcontent. We can get the web page visited. We can't get where they navigated within the website. That's, I may be wrong about that, but I think that's how we are. Within the existing confines of the law. Correct. And so for those who are proposing that we change existing law so as to allow you to use a national security letter to go further, uh, as was suggested by one of my colleagues earlier today, that then would allow you to get this more granular information. No, I'm sorry. I, I may have screwed this up. As we understand the way Ector was intended to be, under, to be used, that our NSL authority under Ector, as we thought it was, and as we hope it will be changed, is limited to that top-level website visit address. Correct. So even if it's changed the way we hope it will be, we don't get any deeper into what, what you looked at on a page. It's as if we're able to see what sporting goods store you called, we can't tell from the call record what you asked about. We can see what sporting page you visited, what website, but we can't see where you went within that. Yeah. Based on the legislation that I've reviewed, uh, it's not my recollection that that is the case. Okay. Now, what I've been told is that it, it would not necessarily be the policy of the government to use it to go to that level of granularity, but that the language itself would allow it. Is that we'll inconsistent see. with your understanding? Uh, it is, and my understanding is we're, we're not looking for that authority. You don't want that authority. You're That's not my understanding. What, what we'd like is the functional equivalent of the dialing information, where you, the address you emailed to, or the or the web page you went to, not where you went within it. Even if you look at it at the broad level of abstraction, so if you're suggesting it would be used only at the domain name level, uh, somebody went to ESPN.com. Uh, if you follow someone's browsing history over a long period of time, you could f still find out a fair amount about that person, could you not? Yes. 
Sure. And again, I, I keep saying this, but I mean it, as you can from their telephone dialing history. Yes. Uh, let's talk about uh, uh, Section 702 for a minute. Uh, Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance uh, Amendments Act authorizes the uh, surveillance, uh, the, the use of U.S. signals uh, surveillance uh, e equipment to obtain foreign intelligence information. Um, the definition includes information that is directly related to national security, uh, but it also includes, quote, information that is relevant to the foreign affairs of the United States, close quote, regardless of whether that foreign affairs related information is relevant to a national security threat. To your knowledge, uh, has the Attorney General or has the DNI um, uh, ever used Section 702 to target individuals abroad uh, in a situation unrelated to a national security threat? Not that I'm aware of. I think I could be wrong, but I don't think so. I think it's confined to counterterrorism, to uh, espionage, to counterproliferation, and well, those, those are the buckets. Okay, I was so going to say cyber, but cyber is, fits within That's the where it has typically yeah. used those things. Um, does it, um, so to your knowledge, it doesn't currently use Section 702 to target people abroad in, in instances unrelated to national security threats? I don't think so. Like a diplomat to find out how someone feels about a particular foreign policy issue or something. I don't think so. Right. So if Section 702 were narrowed to exclude such information, to exclude information that is relevant to foreign affairs but not relevant to a national security threat, um, uh, would that mean that uh, the government would be able to obtain the information it needs uh, in order to protect national security? It would seem so, logically. I mean, to me, the value of 702 is, in, is exactly that, where the rubber hits the road in the national security context, especially counterterrorism, counterproliferation. Yep. Now, when Section 702 is used, typically um, what we're talking about here is not um, metadata. It's not... Uh, this call was made to, from this number to this number. This is content. And so if, if we were talking about two U.S. persons, two American citizens, if, if I were calling you, typically that's not something that Section 702 would be used to collect. But if it's, uh, if it's me calling someone else, and if that person is not a U.S. person, if that person ends up being an agent of a foreign government, and if somebody has determined that communications involving that person uh, might be connected to a national security investigation. Um, there's a, a chance that that communication could be intercepted. Not just the fact the call was made, but also the content of that call. Correct. That, that's what we call incidental collection. And that incidental collection um, is then aggregated. You have databases that store all of these things. And so there are lots of U.S. persons who have had communications, conversations that have themselves been recorded that are out there uh, in, in, a, in a database. Uh, can you search that database for communications involving specific U.S. persons without getting a warrant? Yes. And the fact that these communications were intercepted uh, without necessarily any showing of wrongdoing on the part of the U.S. person, without necessarily showing that that U.S. person had anything to do with the foreign, uh, with the national security investigation at issue, uh, does that cause you concern that that could involve uh, a, almost a back doorway of going after communications by U.S. persons in which they have a reasonable expectation of privacy? It doesn't cause me concern, but it may be because of the way, uh, what I can see from where I am. I understand the question, though. But it's true, whether it's 702 or other court-authorized domestic surveillance in the United States, if we are covering a particular embassy of a foreign power and Americans call in and speak to them, we record that because we're authorized to collect the communications in and out of that embassy. And we store all of those in a database, or we have lawfully collected those, even though the American who called wasn't a target. The same happens with 702. If you contact or call a terrorist or, or someone we're targeting overseas, you're an American, you have a conversation, even though you're not the target, that's going to be collected and stored in a database. What matters is how we treat that data and that we're careful with it and we don't use it willy-nilly and we protect it in, in important ways. That's true whether we collect it in 702 or collect it domestically. I don't know how we would operate otherwise. Uh, and that's, yeah, I don't know how we would operate otherwise. I think what the American people want us to do is make sure we hold it so we can connect dots if it turns out there's something bad in there, but treat it like the U.S. person information that it is. Protect it and make sure that it's handled in a responsible way. Senator Lee. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director, let me uh, let me tell you a story. About a hundred years ago, literally, my Italian grandparents and, and my Irish grandparents uh, faced discrimination because of their religion. Now, that discrimination wasn't violence, it was economic. This was not unusual in this country at that time. I like to think that's gone. I like to think of my grandparents, the Italian grandparents, the Irish grandparents, discrimination they faced because of both their race and their religion is not here. But now we see an alarming rise in hate crimes among minority communities. Yesterday, this committee heard some important testimony from the Department of Justice, from the International Association of Chiefs of Police, I believe our nation's largest civil rights organization, that law enforcement and political leaders must send a message that toxic, hateful rhetoric would not be tolerated. They must denounce bigotry wherever they encounter. Even as a child, I was taught that. We are never to discriminate against anybody because of their race or their religion. Now, what bothers me, uh, let me show you this. <clears throat> On the campaign trail, President Trump promises supporters a Muslim ban. A campaign press release entitled Donald J. J. Trump's Statement on Preventing Muslim Immigration says that he called for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. Now, I can understand that dumb things are said during a campaign. That's on his website today. That goes beyond being stupid. Do you agree with me that messages like that can cast suspicion on our Muslim neighbors, can perpetuate division and hatred, and if it does, does that make America less safe? Well, Senator, thank you. I'm not going to comment on the particular statement, but I do agree that a perception or a reality of hostility towards any community, but in this particular the Muslim American community, makes our jobs harder. Because as I said in response to an earlier question, those good people don't want people engaging in acts of violence on the, in the name of their faith or in their neighborhood. And so our interests are aligned, but if anything gets in the way of that and chills their, their openness to talk to us and to tell us what they see, it makes it harder for us to find those threats. So we, we've been spending a ton of time, you're right, about the increase in hate crimes. We've seen those numbers start to go up in 2014. They've been climbing since then. To redouble our efforts to get in those communities and show them our hearts and what we're like, to encourage people not to fear contact with us. And Director Comey, I don't ask this to make a political point. I ask this as a United States Senator. I believe the United States Senate can be, and sometimes has been, the conscience of the nation. We're a nation with adherence to our First Amendment. We trust and we believe in all religions, allow you to practice any religion you want or none if you want. I worry, whether it's the Muslim religion or any other, you have religions where people believe in it, they should not be condemned the actions of a few. I worry very much that the rhetoric and the hatred can bring about things that neither you nor I ever want to see in this country. I think we'd agree on that. Hate crimes, I don't care who it's against. Again, somebody because of the race or the religion, you as a head of the FBI, any one of us who have been prosecutors, we abhor all hate crimes, and I believe you do. Is that not correct? That's for sure. And I worry that we also give the impression that citizenship alone might be a reliable indicator of the terrorist threat posed by an individual to the United States. I think of the Oklahoma City bombing. One of the greatest acts of terrorism in our country. 
done by an American citizen who served, uh, I believe honorably, in our military. So would you uh, agree that citizenship alone is not a reliable indicator of a terrorist threat posed by an individual to the United States? Correct. Most of the people that I talked about that we have open cases on are American citizens. Thank you. In fact, the Department of Homeland Security We've heard from them. They have an assessment from the Office of Intelligence and Analysis concluded that citizenship is unlikely to be a reliable indicator of potential terrorist activity. Do you agree with that? Yes. Thank you. Another matter, uh, Chairman Grassley and I have worked um, to address the concerns related to the FBI's here and fiber analysis testimony has been flawed. I think we all accept in the past. Investigation began, I believe, 2012 after three men were exonerated here in Washington, D.C. because the FBI analysts gave inaccurate testimony. In order to review more than 3,000 cases, the FBI has reached out to uh, officers that originally prosecuted these cases, and I appreciate that. I remain concerned that cases remain closed if you don't find the transcript right away. Uh, I've asked you this question in, in writing. In any cases there where there's a missing transcript, will you commit to have an FBI conduct an in-person visit to obtain whether there was information that was used and possibly faulty analysis by the FBI that might have brought about a conviction? I'm sorry, an in-person visit? Uh, well, to the uh, prosecutor's office, whoever else may be involved, if you don't have a transcript, uh, an in-person visit to say, okay, was what do your records show? Do you, did you use analyses that may have been faulty from the FBI and bring about the conviction? I see. Um, I, I don't know enough to react to that now and commit to it now. Can I follow up with you? To, to see how we're thinking about that? Will you follow up? I will. I've written to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Senator Leahy. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you. Um, a couple of quick matters for starters. Did you uh, give Hillary Clinton, quote, a free pass for many bad deeds? Uh, there was a tweet to that effect from the oh, president. No, not, that was not my intention, certainly. Well, did you give her a free pass for many bad deeds, whatever your intention may have been? We conducted a competent, honest, and independent investigation, closed it while offering transparency to the American people. I believed what I said. Uh, there was not a prosecutable case there. The, um, with respect to the question of prosecution for classified material, is the question of the consequences of the disclosure, i.e., the harm from the re release or the actual secrecy of the material considered in a prosecutive decision? In my experience, it is, yes. Because there's a great deal of material that, while technically classified, is widely known to the public, and because overclassification is a very significant problem within the executive branch, correct? Correct. And DOJ reserves prosecution for the most serious matters, in my experience. And that would have been evaluated also in looking at uh, Secretary Clinton's emails? Yes. Um, so although they were classified, they may not have caused any harm in terms of who saw them. Well, let me not make it specific to that. There are emails that could be classified and cause no harm if they were disclosed. Yes, there are, there, that is the case. Um, it has been disclosed and publicly reported that there was a two-day interval between the FBI interview of Michael Flynn related to his conversations with Ambassador Kislyak and then Deputy Attorney General's report to White House counsel about those calls. Did you participate in conversations related to this matter during that two-day interval? And what can you tell us about why that interval took two days. Was there some standard operating procedure that needed to be vindicated? Was there, you would think that that could have flipped over to a conversation to the White House a good deal quicker 
than that once the agent's report came back from the interview. Yeah, I don't, I don't know whether the two days is right. I think it might have been a day. I could be wrong. Could have been two days. And I did participate in conversations uh, about that matter. And I think I'll stop there because I, okay. don't, I don't know the department's position on, on uh, speaking about those communications. But as you sit here, you don't have any hesitation about that delay, about any, it representing any kind of you know, mischief or misconduct. No, no. And given your experience, you know how this works. An agent conducts an interview. They're going to come back. They write up a 302. They show it to yep. their partner. They make sure they get it right. Then they produce the 302. So sometimes it's the next day before it's finished. So the deputy, uh, Ms. Yates, would have seen the 302, and that process would have taken place by the time she went up to see White House Counsel McGon. I think that's right, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and on to the uh, Wiener laptop. Um, as I understand it, you were informed by agents in the FBI office that there was potentially related or relevant information in Mr. Weiner's laptop. On the basis of that information, you then sent a letter to the members of Congress before whom you had committed to answer if there were any changes in the uh, status of things. Mm -hmm. um, you also then authorized the agents to pursue a search warrant, which then gave them access to the content which allowed them to do the search that you then said came up with nothing so that you could then undo the letter and say, actually, we took a look and there's nothing there. Is that the, do I have the order correctly there? Right. They came to me. They briefed me on what they could see from the metadata, why it was significant. They thought they ought to seek a search warrant, wanted my approval to do that. I agreed, authorized it, so did the Department of Justice, and then they reviewed, I was just making sure I get the numbers right, during the, the following week they reviewed 40,000 emails, I understated how many they reviewed, and found that 3,000 of them were work-related um, and came from BlackBerry backups and a bunch of other things, and that, question and that 12 of them were uh, classified, but we'd seen them all before. And yeah. So they finished that work, they briefed me on it, and say it doesn't change our, our view, and then I send the second letter. Did any of those classified emails create national security damage? That's a hard one to answer. By definition, the classification is based on the potential national security damage. With respect to our earlier conversation, that yeah. tons of stuff is classified that is on the front page of the New York Times. Yeah. I'm not aware that any of these emails or any of the emails in the investigation got into the hands of people that were able to exploit them to damage our national security. Um, so. Let me offer you this hypothetical. They come to you and say the metadata shows that we have um, potential information here that could be relevant and could cause us to reopen the information. It would seem to me that it would be as sensible at that moment to say how quickly can you get a search warrant and how quickly can we get an answer to that question because I made a promise to people in Congress that I would get back to them with this information. And if there's anything real here, you need to get on that pronto so that I can answer that question. So that the search warrant precedes the letter yep. rather than the letter preceding the search warrant, particularly in light of the widely uh, adhered to policy of the department not to disclose ongoing investigative materials and the truly exceptional nature of disclosures. Yeah. Why not the search warrant first? Well, I pressed them very hard on that and found credible their responses that there was no way, no way they could review the volume of information they saw on the laptop in the time remaining. Except so I, that they did. Well, they, they did, and because our wizards at our operational technology division came up with a way to dedupe electronically that, as I understand it, involved writing a custom software program that's going to help us in lots of other areas. But... The investigative team said, sir, we cannot finish this before the election. So that, to my mind, that then made the judgment uh, appropriate, the one that I made, not waiting, waiting, waiting to make the disclosure. Okay. And with just res respect to your response to Secretary 
uh, to Senator Tillis. We can talk about it some other time. My time has expired, but lest um, silence be viewed as consent, I have a different view of what took place. I don't, don't doubt your honesty for a minute, but I do think that there were very significant mistakes made uh, through this process. In which, in the email case? Yes. Okay. In the Hillary Clinton email case. Got yes. It. Uh, thank you to the ranking member, and I admire uh, your hanging in there uh, and being made of stone, was it? Um, Sandstone, I think. Uh, I, I just want to clarify some, uh, something, some of the answers that you gave me. Uh, for example, in response uh, to Director, I, I asked you, would uh, President Trump's tax returns be material to the, such an investigation, the Russian investigation, um, and does the investigation have access to President Trump's tax returns and some other questions you answered, I can't say, and I'd like to get a clarification on that. Is, is it that you can't say or that you can't say in this setting? That I won't answer questions about the contours of the investigation. Uh, as I sit here, I don't know whether I would do it in a closed setting either, but for sure, I, I, I don't want to begin answering questions about what we're looking at and how. Okay, so I'll take that as at least in this setting you can't do that, and maybe you can elsewhere. We, we're talking about some of the, uh, the number of, the unusual number of individuals uh, in important roles in the Trump uh, campaign or in his life, uh, and they're sort of unexpected and often undisclosed ties to, uh, to Russia. And I'd like to focus on one of those uh, individuals, Roger Stone, and his relationship with Guccifer 2.0. Guccifer 2.0 is an online persona that the uh, IC concluded uh, was used by Russian military intelligence to leak documents and emails stolen from the Democratic National Committee to WikiLeaks. The U.S. intelligence community, including the FBI, has since concluded that the Russian, go Russian government directed the breach and that Russian military intelligence used Guccifer 2.0 to ensure that the documents obtained were publicly released. So. While Guccifer has insisted that he or she is not Russian, the intelligence community has concluded that the hacker has strong ties to Moscow and was used by Russian military intelligence to leak information about the Clinton campaign and the Democrats um, that was stolen by Russia. Is that, Director Comey, a fair characterization? Yes, Gusev, our, the IC's judgment was Guccifer 2.0 was an instrument of the Russian intelligence. Thank you. Well, a few months back, it was revealed that in August of last year, that's a couple months before the 2016 election, Roger Stone, one of President Trump's longstanding political mentors and at one time a for, formal campaign advisor, exchanged a number of private messages with Guccifer 2.0 via Twitter. Mr. Stone has since insisted that the relationship was totally innocuous. Now, in this series of messages, Guccifer 2.0 and Mr. Stone exchange a number of bizarre pleasantries. Guccifer thanks Mr. Stone for writing about him, and Mr. Stone expresses delight that Guccifer's Twitter handle was reinstated after having been suspended. But in one message, Guccifer writes to Mr. Stone, quote, I'm pleased to say that you are a great man. Please tell me if I can help you anyhow. It would be a great pleasure to me. Director Comey, to me, this sounds like a clear offer from a Russian intelligence operative to collaborate with a senior official on the Trump campaign. Um, is that a throwaway line or an offer to help Stone in some respect? Do we know whether any further communication between Stone and Guccifer took place? And if you can't say here or can't say in, in uh, 
but you could say in a, another uh, classified environment, could you make that distinction? I definitely cannot say here. I don't think I would say in a classified environment because it calls for questions about what we're looking at and, and how. Okay. So, but I definitely can't say here. Okay, well, at the very least, Stone's conversation with Guccifer demonstrated, um, uh, once again, that the Trump campaign officials were communicating with Russian operatives. What is less clear, however, is whether the Trump campaign ever provided direction to Russian operatives or were aware that specific actions were being carried out to influence the election. For example, it has been suggested that last year the Russians used thousands of paid trolls, human trolls, we know this, and botnets to flood the internet, particularly social media, and with fake news aimed at influencing the election and favoring President Trump. I'm curious whether such actions were part of a coordinated effort. Is there any evidence that the Trump campaign assisted or directed those efforts? That something that I can't answer here, but I, I would refer you back to what I said was the purpose of the investigation, to understand whether there were any coordination uh, or, or collusion between elements of the campaign and the Russians. Uh, of course. And um, I would point out, too, that um, uh, that right before uh, the Podesta emails came out, uh, that uh, Roger Stone said uh, it's, it look, it, it's soon going to be time for Podesta's time in the barrel. And uh, so I think there may be a little bit of a, a there there. Um, before I, I end, I just want to, I only have 30 seconds, so I, I'm, 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 I want to say this. I know Senator Cornyn isn't here. Uh, I think it's a shame that he said uh, that Hillary yesterday in this forum blamed everyone but herself. She took a lot of blame on herself um, in, um, in that forum. And I think she, when she referenced uh, what you did and uh, in uh, 11 days before the election, which has been a subject here, uh, that and also the Russian interference, I think she was only saying stuff that other people have said. I mean, I don't think she was saying anything that, um, that a lot, a lot of people also think had, uh, had an effect on the election. So I, I just think it was a shame that, um, uh, that the senator from Texas, I don't know if you meant to uh, leave that out deliberately, but she did not blame everyone but herself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Say, before I call on the next senator, there's two things I'd like to say. One would be for what you promised Senator Cruz about a briefing on the Garland situation, mm -hmm. that you would include any of the staff of the committee in on that briefing as well, so we can have a committee briefing on it as well, at least at, at the staff level. Would you do that? I, uh, assuming they have the clearances for it. I, I don't think that's a problem I, I guess, at all. I'll do that. I guess uh, that's, that's obvious. The second thing is, uh, after we have two more people uh, have second round, uh, before they get done, I have to go, and I want to thank you for being here. Senator Feinstein will close down the meeting. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think uh, under the previous order, Senator Hirono was ahead of you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm happy to follow Senator Hirono. Okay. Thank you. Um, as mentioned earlier, Director, in March, President Trump issued a revised refugees and visa ban executive order that suspended entry into the U.S. from six majority Muslim countries. The suspension was, this suspension was largely premised on the claim that, quote, more than 300 persons who entered the United States are refugees are currently su the subjects of counterterrorism investigations by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, end quote. Can you provide any additional information on whether the persons under investigation are from the six countries subject to the suspension? And are these persons exclusively 
from the six countries subject to the su suspension? And if not, what other countries are represented among the population that is currently under investigation? I'm, I'm sure we can provide you. What I, what I can tell you here is I think, I think about a third of them are, are from the six countries. So 300, about a third of them are from the six countries. I think two-thirds of those were from the seventh country, Iraq, that was not included. But, but I'll make sure my staff gets you the precise numbers, Senator. So Iraq is the only other country that was um, not among the six targeted countries? I think that's right. I, obviously, as you ask it, I'm wondering whether I'm wrong. Uh, and so I'll get you the precise numbers. But Thank I, you. I think it was refugees, about 300 about a third from the six countries, about two-thirds from Iraq. That's my Thank you. You can provide the um, information yeah. later. Thank you very much. And can you provide additional information on the percentage of these individuals who came to the U.S. as children? I can't as I sit here. I'm sure we can get you that can information. Can you check that? Thank you. And can you provide additional information on the percentage of these individuals who were radicalized after having been in our country for a long period of time? However way you would describe Yeah, that's a harder one because it's very hard to figure out when someone is radicalized and then when it happened. Uh, I'll ask my folks to think about what information we can get you on that. We'll do our best. Yes, thank you. Probably during the course of your investigation, you might be able to ascertain when they became radicalized. We, um, I'm t uh, turning to the death threats against certain judges. We have an administration that challenges federal judges who disagree with President Trump's views. We've seen this in the campaign and during his presidency. Following Judge Derek Watson's ruling blocking the president's revised travel ban, Judge Watson, who sits on the Hawaii District Court, Judge Watson began receiving death threats. I understand the U.S. Marshals have primary responsibility for the protection of federal judges, but that the FBI is poised to step in if necessary. Is the FBI investigating the threats made against Judge Watson? I believe we are. I was last week visited the Honolulu field office and got briefed on our work, again, to assist the Marshals in trying to understand the threats and protect the judge. So I, I believe we are. And then in February, the three Ninth Circuit judges who ruled against the president's first travel ban also began receiving threats. Is the FBI investigating those threats? I don't know that one for sure. I bet we are, but I can't answer uh, with confidence as I sit here. So can we say that any time federal judges are threatened that the FBI would likely be involved in investigating, investigating those threats? Probably in most circumstances, the marshals have the primary responsibility, and in my experience, they very, very often ask us for assistance on our what information we may have, some of our technical resources. They're pretty darn good, but in most cases, I think we offer assistance. And are the president's continued attacks on the judiciary emboldening, uh, emboldening uh, individuals to make these sorts of threats? We're in an environment where some people might think that it's okay to issue these kinds of threats against uh, judges who disagree with the president? Yeah, that's not something I think I can comment on. Um, it's concerning whenever people are directing threats at judges because their independence and insulation from influence, whether fear or favor, is at the core of the whole justice mm -hmm. system, which is why we take them so seriously. Yes, and, and so speaking of uh, the independence uh, of not just the judiciary, but um, I'd like you to clarify the um, FBI's independence from the DOJ apparatus. Can the FBI conduct an invest investigation independent from the Department of Justice? Or does the FBI have to disclose all its investigations to the DOJ? Does it have to get uh, the uh, Attorney General's consent? Well, we work with the Department of Justice, whether that's Maine Justice or U.S. Attorney's offices, on all of our investigations. And so we work with them. And so in, in a in a legal sense, we're not independent of the Department of Justice. We are spiritually, culturally pretty independent group, um, and that's the way you would want it. But yeah, we work with the Department of Justice on all of our investigations. So if the Attorney General or senior officials at the Department of Justice opposes a specific investigation, can they halt that FBI investigation? In theory, yes. Has it happened? Not in my experience. 
because it would be a big deal to tell the FBI to stop doing something that, without an appropriate purpose. I mean, we're oftentimes, they give us opinions that we don't see a case there, and so you ought to stop investing resources in it. But I'm talking about a situation where we were told to stop something for a political reason. That would be a very big deal. It's not happened in my experience. Well, a number of us have called for an independent investigator or a special prosecutor to uh, investigate the, the Russian efforts to undermine or to interfere with our elections, as well as the Trump uh, team's uh, relationships with these, uh, these Russian efforts. And should the Department of Justice decide that there should be such a, a independent investigator or special prosecutor, and you already have an ongoing FBI investigation into these matters. Uh, how, w and the Attorney General has already recused himself, so how would, you, how would this proceed when you have the Department of uh, uh, Justice conducting or assigning an independent or special prosecutor and then you're already doing an investigation? How would this work? Our investigative team would just coordinate with a a different set of prosecutors. It's as if a case was moved from one U.S. Attorney's Office to another. The investigative team just starts working with a different set of assistant U.S. Attorneys. You don't, you don't miss it. So the two investigations could proceed, but you would talk to each other. Is right. It's one, it's one investigation, and the strength of the justice system at the federal level in the United States is the prosecutors and the agents work together on their investigations, and so the investigators would disengage from one prosecutor and hook up to another and just continue going. So in the investigations that you're currently doing um, on the Russian interference and the Trump team's uh, relationship, uh, are you coordinating with uh, any U.S. Attorney's Office on yes. those investigations? Well, uh, two sets of prosecutors, Main Justice, the National Security Division, and the Eastern District of Virginia U.S. Attorney's Office. So should the AG decide to go with a special prosecutor, then you would end your uh, engagement with these other two entities and, and work with the uh, DOJ well, I could, special yeah, prosecutor? Potentially. Or it could be that in some circumstances an attorney general appoints someone else to oversee it, and you keep the career-level prosecutive team. And so to the prosecutors and the agents, there's no change except the boss is different. If I could just ask one more follow-up question. So the, does this, has this happened before where you're doing an investigation and the Attorney General uh, appoints a special prosecutor to conduct the same investigation? It happened to me when I was in what I thought was my last job ever in the government as Deputy Attorney General, and I appointed Patrick Fitzgerald, then the U.S. Attorney in Chicago, to oversee a very sensitive investigation involving allegations that Bush administration officials outed a CIA operative. And so what happened is the team of agents that had been working for uh, up a chain that came to me was just moved over and worked up under Patrick Fitzgerald. Okay, thank you. So it happens. Thank, thank you, you Manager. Senator. Last but far from least, Senator Blumenthal. <coughs> thank you, uh, <coughs> Madam Chair. Uh, to take the analogy that you began with, I think we're at the end of the dentist visit, uh, or toward the end of it anyway. And. Uh, Fortunately, there's no unlimited time that uh, the last questioner can take. Uh, My dentist sometimes asks questions, too. <laughs> uh, to, to pursue the line of questioning that Senator Hirono just, just finished, uh, there is abundant precedent, is there not, for the appointment of a special prosecutor. In fact, there are regulations and guidelines for the appointment of a special prosecutor. Yes. And that has happened frequently in the history of the Department of Justice. You mentioned one in your experience. Also, uh, then designee Attorney General uh, Richardson appointed a special prosecutor, Archibald Cox, who then pursued the Watergate investigation, correct? Yes, there's been many examples of it. So this would not be a earth-shaking seismic occurrence for a special prosecutor to be appointed. In fact, taking your record, which is one of dedication to the credibility and integrity of our criminal justice process and your families, I would think that at some point you might recommend that there be a special prosecutor. Would that be appropriate at some point? It's possible. I know one of my predecessors did it. Louis Freed did it with respect to a 
Clinton administration issue about Chinese interference in election. So it's possible. And I take your contention that you don't want to talk about your conversations with the current Deputy Attorney General, but my hope is that you will, in fact, argue forcefully and vigorously for the appointment of special prosecutor. I think that the circumstances here are exactly parallel to the situation where you appointed Patrick Fitzgerald, Fitzpatrick and others where routinely special prosecutors have been appointed. And uh, I know that your recommendation may never be disclosed, but I would urge that, that you do so. Uh, going back to uh, the questions that you asked about your announcement initially that you were terminating the investigation of Hillary Clinton. You said that the matter was one of intense public interest and therefore you were making additional comments about it. Normally, there would have been no comments, correct? Correct. And at most, you would have said, as you did just now, there was no prosecutable case, correct? Correct. And you went beyond that statement and said that she had been ex extremely careless, I believe was the word that you used, which was an extraordinary comment. Would you agree that the investigation of the Trump campaign's potential involvement in the Russian interference is also an investigation of intense public interest? Yes, I agree. In fact, there are probably very few investigations that will be done while you're FBI director that will be of more intense public interest. And my question is, will you commit to explaining the results of the investigation at the time when it is concluded. I won't commit to it, Senator, but I, I do commit to apply the same principles and, and reasoning to it. I just don't know where we'll end up, so I can't commit sitting here. But you would agree that as the FBI director, you would need to go beyond simply saying there's no prosecutable case or there is a prosecutable case. Potentially. When I was U.S. Attorney uh, many years ago, there was actually a rule in the Department of Justice that there could be no report on any grand jury matter or any investigation without permission of the Attorney General or main justice. I don't know whether that rule still applies, but speaking more generally, do you think it's a good idea for prosecutors or yourself to be able to comment in some way to explain the results of an investigation? Not in general, I don't. I think, it, I think it's important that there be, as there has been for a long time, a recognized exception for the exceptional case. I referred to the IRS uh, alleged targeting investigation, which was also of intense public interest, and then I actually had someone prepare for me a chart. The department has done it infrequently, but done it a dozen or more times in the last five, ten years. It ought to be reserved for those extraordinary cases, but there are times where the public interest warrants it. With respect to the investigation ongoing into the Trump Associates' ties to the Russian meddling, has the White House cooperated? With the investigation? Correct. It's not something I'm going to comment on. Have you had any requests for immunity from anyone potentially a target of that investigation? I have to give you the same answer, Senator. Would you tell this committee if there is a lack of cooperation on the part of the White House? I won't commit to that. Isn't there, again, another reason for there to be a special prosecutor? Because who would you complain to the Deputy Attorney General, if there were a lack of cooperation on the part of the Trump White House? If there was a challenge with any investigation that I couldn't resolve at, at the uh, working level, I would elevate it to the Deputy Attorney General, whoever was in charge of it. But the Deputy Attorney General is appointed by the President.
correct? Correct. Isn't that an inherent conflict of interest? It's, it's a consideration, but also the nature of the person in the role is also a very important consideration. I think we're lucky to have somebody who thinks about the justice system very similar to the way I do and Pat Fitzgerald does and the way you did. And let me um, ask again to just clarify a question that uh, Senator Hirono asked. The career prosecutors so far involved are in the National Security Division in Maine Justice and the Eastern District of Virginia United States Attorney's Office, correct? Correct. But the decision about prosecuting would be made by their boss, I think is the word you use, correct? Correct. And that would probably be, right now, the Deputy Attorney General, correct? Correct. In a matter of, of, of uh, complexity and significance, the decision, ultimate decision in practice is almost always made at the highest level in the department, which would be uh, Rod Rosenstein. Uh, and let me ask uh, one last question unrelated. Uh, you were asked by Senator Leahy about targets of investigation. I think your comment was that there were more citizens currently under investigation for potentially terrorist violence or extremist violence than non-citizens. Is that correct? Correct. In terms of sources of information, are there many non-citizens who have provided such information? Yes. And are a large number of them undocumented residents of the United States? I don't know what percentage. I'm sure some significant percentage are. So cooperation from them is important, and the fear of apprehension, of roundups, of mass detention would be a significant deterrent for them. Would it not? In theory, I don't know whether we've seen an impact in practice, though. I, don't, I just don't know, as I sit here. Could you inquire or do some internal research to the extent it is possible and report back to us about sure. it? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much, um, Senator. <clears throat> Director, I think this concludes the hearing. Let me thank you for your ability to last for many hours. It's very <laughs> impressive. And let me also thank ladies and gentlemen in the audience. Many of you b have been here from the very beginning. Thank you for your attention and uh, uh, th thank you for being respectful. It's very much appreciated. And the hearing is adjourned. Yes, ma'am. I'll be there. Put it right into my car. Yeah.